On a very cold but sunny day in Pittsburgh, Three River Stadium, we have a rematch of last year's AFC Championship battle, the Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Houston Oilers. Playing conditions today a lot better than they were last year when the weather was absolutely miserable. It was Pittsburgh's ability to move the football and Houston's failure to do the same that resulted in a 34-5 win for the men of steel. Houston committed nine turnovers. However, this is a different Houston Oilers ball club with some very different faces. Like number 14, quarterback Gifford Nielsen, who replaced an injured Dan Pastorini to lead the Oilers to an improbable 17-14 win last week over San Diego. However, Dan Pastorini is healthy and will start today's game. He led the Oilers to a 20-17 win over the Steelers the last time these two teams met. And his mobility will be the big question. Can he escape a very fair steel curtain pass rush that features a lot of blitzing like this one by number 31 All-Pro safety man Donnie Schell? On offense for Pittsburgh, Terry Bradshaw has enjoyed another outstanding season, and the Oilers will have to contain him as well as the likes of his stellar wide receivers like Lynn Swan and team MVP number 82, John Stallworth. We'll have a preview of today's game as NBC kicks off its AFC championship coverage with NFL 79. Sports presents NFL 79, an inside look at professional football and a preview of today's championship game. Brought to you by the new 1980 Volkswagen Rabbit, Dasher, and Chiraco. Volkswagen does it again. And by these fine products from G. Howland Brewing Company, across Wisconsin, and other cities. Pennsylvania prides itself as the city of champions and Free River Stadium, which has hosted many of this city's most dramatic athletic moments, is the site of today's AFC Championship game, Houston versus Pittsburgh. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Adamley, and the reason why I'm standing here without a coat on like an idiot is to illustrate a point. You know, on cold weather days, coaches like to play amateur psychologists. They like to psych their players into thinking it's warm when in actuality it's not. Certainly the Pittsburgh Steelers do this better than anyone. They have won 15 consecutive games here in this stadium, but they are especially tough when the weather is rugged. Certainly the Oilers took note. Yesterday in practice, several of their players were running around with just shorts and short sleeves to combat the weather. Myself, I've been standing out here for the last two hours thinking it's warm, thinking it's 70 degrees, but let me tell you, I'm freezing my can off, and if you're listening, Bud Grant, you speak with a forked tongue. Brian Gumbel is standing by in New York, and Brian, this concludes our 1979-1980 football season. As always, it's been an enjoyable one working with you, and I think, pal, we are going to be treated to a whale of a football game. You saved your best opening for last. There are a lot of amateur psychologists at home talking about you right now. I agree with you. I think we've got a great game. I agree with a lot of people that today is the Super Bowl because the NFL's two best are playing here today. But, Mike, as we look at this game, we've got to think back to those injuries to Campbell, Pastorini, and we know they're going to play, but how well can they be expected to play in light of the injuries? Earl Campbell is supposed to be 100%. He's had two weeks of rest. They say he's as running as hard as he ever has had. Uh, Dan Pastorini was throwing the football in practice yesterday. He looked pretty good. He, and with the conditions fairly dry, he should be mobile this afternoon. So I think they'll be ready. Okay, Mike, much has been made of last year's 34-5 verdict. Is it going to be any factor at all? Is it going to be on the minds of either team? I don't think so. If any team in football can beat Pittsburgh, it's the Houston Oilers. They beat them earlier in the year in the Astrodome, and they are the last team to beat the Steelers here in Three Rivers. So I don't think that's going to be a factor. Covering today game for NBC, uh, giving you the play-by-play -play and expert analysis, Dick Enberg and Merlin Olson. And gentlemen, you've had a chance to reflect on last year's game, your perceptions about what's going to happen today. Michael, last year, 
We were blessed with a bad day. It was a freezing rain, as you'll recall. The ice schools forming on the crossbars as Pittsburgh froze out Houston 34 to 5 and earned a trip to the Super Bowl victory later in Miami. It's cold today, but at least we don't have the precipitation. Well, this is great weather compared to that one last year. I think, though, the thing we have to think about, Dick, is that it's like a good, good news, bad news story. The good news is that the Houston Oilers have over overcome all their adversity, all the long odds, all the problems. They're in this AFC championship game. A lot of people never expected them to be here. The bad news, they have to play this game in Pittsburgh against the best team in football, a team that is 24 of the last, 23 of the last 24. They've won at home 15 in a row. That's bad news in cold weather especially. Well, you talk about the good news, Earl Campbell will play, but can Campbell play well on what amounts to a frozen turf, at least 50 yards of it? Well, he was trained on dry turf. And he plays well on artificial turf, but in the snow and on the ice, and we do have ice on the field, it's going to be very difficult for him today. We'll watch him early. Now back to Brian Gumbel in New York. Okay, Dick Enberg, thank you very much. Later today, after Houston and Pittsburgh get done, the Rams and Buccaneers will meet for the NFC title game, and that's news. First time in 12 years, neither the Vikings or the Cowboys will be involved in that game. Rams have been in this championship five of the last six. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, first time ever. They've come a long way in four years, but Doug Williams says there's no pressure on them. One time you let the pressure get to you is when you read what the press say and, and you know, listen to what people say. And if you sit there and believe that, then the pressure get to you. But if you read it and just let it go by, you wouldn't worry about it. We're just going to have to stop Ricky Bell. He likes to run outside and likes to run up the middle on the I uh, plays, M leads. They pass the ball fairly well, although Williams is not that good a quarterback. If we uh, take advantage and move the ball offensively and hog the ball and keep it away from them, we'll win. Fred Dreyer has never been one to mince his words. You heard him. Doug Williams is not that good a quarterback. Rest assured, his words have reached the coast of Florida. They've added a bit of spice to today's NFC championship affair. We'll get back to AFC matters. We'll look at Pittsburgh, at Houston, and their two coaches. All that and more when we come back right after this. Highly regarded as the toughest division in all of football, the AFC Central, the Steelers and Oilers both had tough roads to reach their day today. The Oilers early on this year hurt by an injury to Dan Pastorini. They did it with three feet, two belonging to Earl Campbell, one to Tony Frisch. But as they turned into the second half, they turned in some very big victories at Miami and then beating Oakland and Dallas. As for the Steelers, well, they established their dominance early on, beating such powerhouses as Denver and Houston. And in the second half, they were just as strong. It's been a tough 18 weeks, as we learn in these reports. Last year, Pittsburgh defeated Houston in the AFC Championship game. The lopsided score and the miserable weather conditions made it an unforgettable day for the Oilers. But when they returned home that night, Houston fans had gathered here in the Astrodome to make it even more unforgettable. We're gonna bust our ass to win number 14. It was the largest pep rally ever. 50,000 fans waited for hours until the Oilers arrived home just to let the team know they still cared. And win or lose, there will be another pep rally tonight when the Oilers go home. But I believe that had a lot to do with us going back this year. And, and believe me, we don't plan to come to, back to the Astrodome this year with a loss. Getting back to the AFC Championship has not been easy for the Oilers. But steady defense and the running of NFL rushing champion Earl Campbell led Houston to an 11-5 regular season record. In the wild card playoff game two weeks ago against Denver, Campbell was lost after pulling a groin muscle on this touchdown. Then later in the game, quarterback Dan Pastorini was also lost when he too pulled a growing muscle on this play. Still, the Oilers were able to hold on for a 13-7 win over the Broncos. The Oilers were without Pastorini and Campbell last week against San Diego. Gifford Nielsen and Rob Carpenter did a superb job of filling in. And as it did the week before, the Houston defense rose to the occasion. Safety Vernon Perry intercepted four passes and blocked the field goal attempt to lead Houston to the win, 17 to 14. I think it was the best ball game I've ever seen played, really. You know, and I've seen a lot of good ball games, not only our football team, but a lot of other football teams play. And I think it was probably the most courageous football game I've ever seen played. Bum and his boys know it will take another all-out team effort to beat Pittsburgh today and they intend on making tonight's pep rally a victory celebration. Now let's go to D. Thompson in Pittsburgh for a report on the Steelers. 
Houston players admit it's no fun playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. You prefer walking off the field after one of those hard-hitting games, but many times you're carried off or wheeled off in a stretcher. Players like safety Donnie Shell and linebacker Dennis Dirt Winston play hard, hit hard, then pat you on the back after a game. Playing hard is Shell's philosophy. You know, but you know, when we put the pass on and the game starts and the whistle blows, then you know, we down to business. And uh, football is a tough, aggressive game, and uh, that's the way it should be played. And uh, you know, if, if you don't like to play that way, you know, you shouldn't be in this league. And uh, you know, after the game, you know, we're friends. But you know, during the game, and you know, it's all it's all business. Winston played Texas teams in college, and it's a carryover into the pros for him. It was a personal challenge when Arkansas would play Texas, and you know, there's rivalries there. And I kind of feel that it's still a rivalry because now I'm in Pittsburgh and uh, Houston is in the Central Division. And, uh, you know, I, I got to feel the same way. Two years ago, the Steelers gave the Oilers attache cases. Houston had to beat Cincinnati for Pittsburgh to get into the playoffs. Lynn Swan and Joe Green were so impressed with the way Houston played, they collected money for gifts. They went about beating Cincinnati and allowed us to go. And instead of just saying we thank them through the media, a uh, number of us got together and we arranged to buy attache cases for their entire team and staff. After Pittsburgh whipped Houston last year, Oiler coach Bum Phillips gave Terry Bradshaw a cowboy hat. Bum and I are very good friends. I'm probably uh, as good of friends with Bum as I am any coach in the National Football League. And it's just something he wanted to do. It's the kind of guy he is. Cowboy hats and attache cases are nice gifts, but the real prize the Steelers and Oilers want is a Super Bowl trophy. And that's what they'll be trying to get a shot at today. This is D. Thompson reporting for NFL 79. All chicanery aside, Houston's coach Bum Phillips faced his toughest decision last week when he decided to rest Earl Campbell. And yesterday, our Merlin Olsen had a chance to talk to Bum about that decision. Coach Earl Campbell said if you had asked him to go into that game last week, he would have played. Mo many coaches, in fact, most of the coaches in the NFL would have made that request. What makes Bum Phillips different? Well, I don't, Merlin, I don't, in the first place, I don't believe any coach would ever play a player that they feel like shouldn't be in the game. I didn't feel like he should be in the game, and of course, I wouldn't have asked him. I don't doubt that he would have done it, and it makes me proud for him to say that, but uh, I just wouldn't have done it. You face a situation this week with Pastorini back and going to play. Uh, young Gifford Nielsen uh, certainly filled in admirably. What would it take to get Pastorini out of the lineup if he is bothered by that injury during the game? It'd be, have to be something major. You know, he'd have to go down and not be able to get up and play. And Dan has played long enough that he will, you know, he'll look me in the eye just like he did the other day before the game. He said, I thought I could go, but he said, I can't, you know. And he said, I can do it, but he said, I'm not going to be full speed. And he said, I think Gifford will do better than I would half speed. Bob, you said that the road to the Super Bowl leads through Pittsburgh. You're here playing in that last game. If you play your best game, and Pittsburgh plays their best game. Who goes to the Super Bowl? Naturally, Houston. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Coach. All right. With all due respect to Tampa Bay and Los Angeles, many people are calling this game the Super Bowl. Not only are Pittsburgh and Houston the two best teams in the NFL, they also possess two of the most respected coaches in Chuck Knoll and Bum Phillips. Polka, pro football history will note that the 1970s was a decade dominated by the Steelers. There are many ingredients in the Steelers' formula for success, most notably their quiet coach, Chuck Knoll. Pittsburgh Steelers emerged from the 70s with pro football's most clearly defined personality. They were the men in black the intimidators. They rose above the elements and their opponents to take the NFL by storm. The Pittsburgh Steelers ran roughshod through the decade and along the way earned the title world champions. enough, this dynamic team is led by a man who seemed to have no personality at all. Somber Chuck Knoll took over a team in 1969, which had not won a division title in 40 years, and led them to three Super Bowl victories. Yet he remains a faceless enigma to all but his closest associates. 
When Chuck Noll first came to Pittsburgh back in 69, he told Joe Gordon, a director of publicity for the Steelers, I told him straight off the bat, look, uh, let me make one thing clear. I'm not interested in becoming a personality. I'm interested in building a football team and winning football games. And that has been the case throughout. Here is a guy who does not do commercials, and I think that's a major reason why he's not known to the nation and why he's often referred to as Chuck Knox. Uh, also, he says that the, the players have a short career, so let them have the commercials and make the money. And there's no question, by taking that stance, he's passed up hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he's quite an amazing person, I think. Uh, I, I know that he is, but I think that the ball players think that he's amazing because he can sit there and he can talk to you, oh, about anything that's going on. He talked to you about flying, talked to you about scuba diving, talked to you about stereos, talked to you about philosophy, talked to you about probably anything that you can cover. He's a very astute man. He's a, he's a student uh, of a lot of things, probably a student of, of life in general. He's a very emotional man. Most people don't see that because he can control it very quickly and by the time that the, the cameras pan the sideline, he's under control and so the viewing audience really doesn't see it. In 1974, uh, Oakland and uh, Miami were in a playoff game, which Oakland won. And there was a lot of talk of, uh, from Johnny Madden and various people that the Super Bowl would be anticlimactic because of this great game that was played between Miami and Oakland. And we'd just beaten Buffalo, and we are getting ready to go out to Oakland. And Chuck came in and says, those guys think they played in a Super Bowl. And Chuck's mouth is only about that wide when he's, when he's serious. And it's turned down at both corners, and his eyes are just slits, you know. And he says, those guys that think they played the Super Bowl, we're going to show them on Sunday they haven't played in the Super Bowl. Joe Green jumped up and yelled, and, and the fire went through that team. And from that point on, the Pittsburgh Steelers, I think, became the team of the decade. And I can almost point to that, that very instant that that was the time that the Pittsburgh Steelers developed the confidence themselves that has carried on through till uh, 1980. Uh, Chuck Noll is thought to be very distant with his players. I'm not sure how true that is. Uh, for example, just two nights before Christmas this year, Terry Bradshaw and his wife and Lynn Swan and his wife and Moon Mullins and his fiance went out Christmas caroling and showed up at Chuck Noll's front door. They sang him Christmas carols. He invited them in for a little Christmas cheer. Then he looked at his wristwatch and noted that it's 13 minutes after 11, you've broken curfew, but I'll forget it, provided you are not arrested on the way home. Michael, intimidation is generally a part of any big football game, but I don't think either team is going to scare the other off the field today. Well, Jack Ham was telling me that he knew the Steelers had it in the bag last year when he saw Ken Burrow run his first pass route like this. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen today. I don't think so either. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha Franklin sang it, but it's in the air in Pittsburgh on both sides of the field. It's the Oilers and the Steelers for the AFC Championship. Mike and I will be with you at halftime, but for now we're moments away from kickoff. Let's go back to Three Rivers, rejoin Dick Yenberg and Merlin Olsen. Thank you, Brian and Mike, and a great job. Two quick facts. One, the current temperature, 22 degrees. Fact number two, the guy who wages a bob on a contest like this says it's a 10-point game. So it is a Pittsburgh, powerful Pittsburgh team that has to be beaten. Can Houston do it? Well, Houston has fought its way into this game with hard-fought victories on the road. They've done it with big plays and with emotion. As was shown by Rob Carpenter in his gallant effort against San Diego, tried to save a timeout, crawling back into the trenches was Carpenter. It was that kind of emotional output by Houston. Turnovers might be the story in this game. The Houston Oilers lead the league in turnovers. They've taken the ball away 52 times and certainly one of the most exciting 50 times. And one of the most exciting things for us was watching Vernon Perry work last week against the San Diego Chargers. Now the peripatetic Perry had four interceptions. He blocked a field goal, ran with that. He seemed to be all over San Diego Stadium. Some say that he was even selling popcorn when, when his own offense was on the field. That's the kind of plays you need, especially when you are an underdog and with a slick ball. And believe me, it's going to be slick and hard to hang on to today. Those turnovers might be critical. As we said, Houston leads with 50 takeaways. Pittsburgh has given the ball away 52 times. That's number one in giveaways in the NFL. Merlin, they're talking about Pittsburgh being the team of the 1970s, and one of the reasons they play so well at home, and also when they get into bad weather, Terry Bradshaw seems to play his very best. 
Bradshaw is at his best at home, in the playoffs, and in cold weather. I think he's the best bad weather quarterback in all of football. And he has some great tools to work with. Here's John Stallworth against Miami. Not only can he catch the ball, knows how to run it into the end zone. But these are the money games, the ones that lead to the big payoff, the Super Bowl. And you talk about the money back. Number 32, Franco Harris. 15 playoff games. Harris has led all rushers 12 times. And if I had to choose one back to run on a slick field, and we've got some icy spots on this field, he's right there, number 32, Franco Harris, an upright style, has both feet on the ground. He's incredible on a slick day. So you feel there's no question Harris versus Campbell. Harris's style is built for this day. We're going to have to keep an eye on Campbell right from the beginning to see if he can run on this field. And defensively, you talk about the Steelers. They're Count Dracula in cleats, number 58, Jack Lambert. He's always looked that way to me, and I'm sure to offensive players across the league but he is the heart and soul of this defensive team he's an incredible player and he'll be doing his job out there today so it's powerful Pittsburgh against surprising Houston the winner goes to the ball in Pasadena well almost a Cinderella story if Houston can pull it out today they've taken it against long odds it's going to be exciting to see if they can make this one and a sellout crowd of over 50,000 and three rivers stadium will be rooting for their beloved Pittsburgh Steelers we're just moments away from this AFC championship game and we'll be right back we've got lots of football ahead we'll be ready for the kickoff of today's game following these words from your local station ABC Sports presents the best of the National Football League, the American Football Conference Championship Game. Today, from Three Rivers Stadium, it's the Houston Oilers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Today's game is brought to you by Dodge. Test drive the new 1980 Dodge cars. Engineered with room, styling, ride, and handling. By Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. By Allstate Insurance Companies. You're in good hands with Allstate. And by Avis. Featuring new seven-day and weekend super saver rates. Avis tries harder and succeeds. across the Ohio River it's Three Rivers Stadium Pittsburgh Pennsylvania home of the defending champion Pittsburgh Steelers they were 9-0 here in 1979 the only NFL team not to lose at least once on its home field and inside a full house of over 50,000 fans to see if the defending champion Steelers will go to Pasadena two weeks hence or will it be the underdog amazing Houston Oilers who have competed in the same AFC Central Division this year that goes to Pasadena Jim Tunney is the referee and we're about to have the official toss of the coin to decide who will get the ball first. In his head, Pittsburgh has won the toss and will receive the show you the ball. Pittsburgh comes out a winner. They won the toss already. Well, the Houston Oilers also won something. They've got the better footing at the left side, left end of the field as we look at it and they'll force Pittsburgh to go into that rough turf. Let's talk about the field condition again, Merlin. To our right, the end zone to our right was frozen. This morning, they were chipping the outside of that end zone, where to the left with the sunshine. That's the part that will have the poorest footing today. That field basically, although it looks okay, is frozen. They've also used a chemical de-icer on that part of the field. And my experience with that, Dick, is that it puts a scum on the ball, a thin scum. And I think the ball is going to be very difficult to handle today. It is cold, about 22 degrees. And we're going to see a lot of fumbles, I think, and a lot of turnovers in this ball game today. We're pleased you've joined us for this AFC championship game. Of course, the winner will take on the NFC champion, either Tampa Bay or the Los Angeles Rams in their game to be played later. Larry Anderson, the deep man for the Steelers at the seven yard line. Tony Frisch will kick it off for the white jerseyed Houston Oilers. Frisch on his way to the Pro Bowl, named the top kicker in the AFC. It's Pittsburgh weather. The indoor Oilers feel that they are geared for another upset win. And we're underway. Anderson at the 10. Look at him skate his way out to the 31-yard line. So Larry Anderson very careful as he made his moves. And even at that, you saw him skid and skate. Terry Bradshaw takes his team onto the field. Offensively, it's Bradshaw at quarterback. 
Big Sidney Thornton, fine blocker, teaming with Franco Harris as the running backs for the Steelers. Lynn Swan and the incredible John Stallworth, a great tandem outside for Bradshaw with Big Benny Cunningham, the tight end. First down, Anderson actually threw that crowd, got all the way to the 34-yard line on his return. And it's Rocky Blyer in there instead of Sidney Thornton. Franco Harris up the middle. with Art Stringer 53 on the tackle. Dick, we don't get a chance to see the faces of these offensive linemen. Ted Peterson is in there for John Cope. Sam Davis, the captain. The center may be the best around. In fact, I think he is. Mike Webster. Right guard Steve Corson has won his way into that lineup and maybe the best of the bunch this year. Larry Brown, amazingly strong. Second down and five for Bradshaw. That is 39 yards. Flyer, the former Notre Dame star, will bring up third down and three. Flyer now in his 11th year. Of course, that great Vietnam story. Defensively for the Oilers. Andy Doris has had a great year left in. Curly Cope, a lot of pressure on him on the nose. And Elvin Bethea, he's almost as old as I am. One of the oldest bodies around. A horse in Ted Washington. Bingham, their leader. The other two linebackers, Stringer. Finally, Robert Brazil, great pro bowler and all-pro player. First throw as a man open. Stallworth at the 41 of Houston after Bradshaw ducked the defensive pressure. Terry Bradshaw is one of the strongest quarterbacks in the NFL. He probably should have been sacked. We're first going to give you an idea why John Stallworth was open. Stallworth just on a little pattern there. You saw how carefully he made his turn. Now he's shifted his feet around almost like a basketball player shuffling. Craig Stemrick made the tackle, an 18-yard pass play. Pittsburgh and Houston Territory on their first drive. Fake to Harris. Lots of time. He fires too tall for Stallworth, and it appears that Pittsburgh's going to work on that matchup Stallworth against Greg Stemrick. The Houston Oilers deep defense features four men who intercepted 23 passes this year. And of course, they were led by Mike Reinfeld, the NFL leader with 12. J.C. Wilson, who played here at Pittsburgh. Greg Stemrick at the other corner. The man of the hour last week, Vernon Perry. And Reinfeld with his 12 thefts to lead the NFL. Second down and 10 at the Houston 41 defensive backs in for the Oilers. Flyer in motion. Draw to Harris. And Harris ducks out of bounds near the 35. They had Franco trapped, but he still has that fine speed to the outside and made six yards. It's third and four. Franco Harris surprisingly quick for a big man. Has power, but also knows what he can and can't do on this slick field. And you saw him there not trying to make that violent cut, but easing his way and, and finally just went out of bounds. We've got to ask the question again as soon as we get a chance to see Houston on offense. Can Earl Campbell make those cuts? His cuts are so violent he may not be able to do it. They are in the part of the field where you do have good footing. There was sun on that field earlier this morning. Third and four. Good protection. Intercepted. Vernon Perry. 40. He might go all the way. Perry at the 35, the 30. Vernon Perry. Touchdown, Houston. 75 yards. The star of the win is San Diego. Vernon Perry. City again and they have got to believe that Bradshaw simply threw into the coverage watch it right here there's no way that that pass goes to anyone but Vernon Perry and Perry of course taking full advantage how could you believe that the man who was so fantastic last week could come back and put them on the right page at the beginning of this game they've got their six they're going for seven what a tremendous break for the Houston Oilers now Tony Fresh to try the extra point on a frozen part of the field. Gifford Nielsen to hold. It's good. Vernon Perry, who did everything but score a touchdown last week, gets one in the first two and a half minutes today. And with 12 and a half minutes left in the first quarter, Houston jumps in front 7-0. Vernon Perry from Jackson. 
Jackson State has gone 75 yards for the first score of the game with a pass interception of Bradshaw. I asked Vernon Perry in the locker room before the game, I said, have you got another big game in you? He said, I got two. Well, he started this one off right, didn't he, Dick? He certainly did, and Perry has Houston on the board with seven, 12 and a half minutes remaining in the first quarter. Frisch to kick it off. Larry Anderson deep for Pittsburgh. Hits this one deeper. Anderson at his seven. 20, and down at the 24-yard line. Booby Clark, the former Bengal, makes the tackle for Houston. this year it was because they turned the ball over an incredible amount of time so that was always on the road I would say one thing too in the last two trips here Houston has had turnover trouble Pastorini has thrown five interceptions in, the, uh, in each of those last two games played on this turf Stallworth left Swan to the right from the Pittsburgh 24 Blyer and Harris split behind Bradshaw Bingham and Robert Brazil made the tackle. That interception returned the longest in championship history, and Vernon Perry has rewritten the record books for the defensive backs. It's just two short weekends. He's had a big eraser out, a man cut by the Bears three years ago, went to the Canadian Football League, and this is his first year in the NFL, had three interceptions all year, and has had five and two playoff games. statistics earlier as the number four rusher all time that does not include a thousand one hundred eighty six that does include a thousand one hundred eighty six yards rushing this year but look at that upright style and watch the cutting ability of Franco Harris he has such good vision and such amazing ability at cutting back against the grain and I think with emotional pursuit that's been one of his edges in playoff games first down at the thirty five Vernon Perry also leads Houston in tackles in these playoff games. He's everywhere. He certainly has played some great ball. And we're going to get a chance to see him in action. You see right there at the bottom of your picture, number 32 coming in and actually tried to take the head off of Rocky Blyer. Let's see how he got there. Quick read. You see him started back on the pass. Reach run. He's got a force inside out. Gets away from the blocker. Gets a good chunk of the tackle right there. Second down and seven. Carter Hardwick, fifth defensive back, is in. And so is Jesse Baker, number 75, at defensive end. Blyer. Good blocks. And Blyer has a first down at the 47 of Pittsburgh. Art Stringer made the tackle. Interesting call by Bradshaw. Well, I think everyone in the park, including the Houston Oilers, expected Franco to have that ball, but it goes to Rocky Blyer, and Blyer knows exactly where he's headed. He almost sniffed that extra yard. We have an injured Oiler number 33, J.C. Wilson. One of the things that's happened for Terry Bradshaw all year, when he has started badly in a game, He's had a hard time pulling himself out. He looks a little tentative in the early going here, and certainly that interception has to have bothered him. He stayed on the ground, which was his game plan originally. He wanted to establish the running game. Let's see if he can get his confidence back and get rolling. Wilson out, number 33, appears to not be seriously injured. Carter Hartwig, 36, playing that left corner. Let's see if Bradshaw goes out. actions of both passer and receiver they want to make sure those feet are underneath them solidly and not making any quick darting moves that you would see uh, well in the September or October games of this NFL year what a contrast deck to the way that Bradshaw and these Steelers came out against Miami last week they came out and just tore Miami's defense to bits but they are tentative they are concerned and a champion can't afford to get conservative in the big games seven to nothing Houston leads on a long Interception touchdown by Vernon Perry, 75 yards. In second and 10, Bradshaw audibilizing. Harris 
on the quick toss. He's to the Houston 48-yard line. Hit there by Stringer 53 and Hartwig 36. It'll be third down and five. We've got a four-man rush. Mike Stenfruit, pick number 67. One of their early picks this year. He's really come on for them as a pass rusher. They put him in a place of Curly Culp, so they won't go to a four-man rush. Just change Stenfruit. Nine minutes and 45 seconds remaining. First quarter. Third and five. Bradshaw. Pressure. He gets loose, and then a saving tackle by 65, Elvin Bethay. The veteran Bethay, just as Bradshaw was going to skip out of that pocket and had a lot of running room to his right, Bethay caught him by a heel. One of the things we may see today is Bradshaw running. He hasn't done much of it this year except to get time, but in this game, he'll do it. You see it right there. Had he gotten by Bethay, he might have had that first down. In fact, I think he would have, Dick. Craig Colquitt in the punt for Pittsburgh. Deep to return is Richard Ellender, who wasn't supposed to play today. He's another one of those injured Oilers. He has a cracked hip, and he's in the game. Short kick. Ellender lets it bounce. 14. And smothered at the 17-yard line. And now the Steeler fans will cheer for their defense. 40-yard kick, 3-yard return, timeout. Left in the first quarter, AFC Championship game has Houston in front by seven. Houston Oilers have their first play from scrimmage. Pittsburgh, 13 plays. The Oilers about to put it in play for the first time. 16-yard line, seven nothing Houston. Earl Campbell gets only a yard or two. And does he draw a crowd? Robin Cole, 56. John Banasak, 76. Dan Pastorini, the quarterback for the Oilers. The greater old Campbell, two years, two times the rushing champion NFL. Blocking back, Tim Wilson, 45. Wide receiver, Ken Burrow, their long ball threat. Richard Castor, the veteran, former Jet, on the other side. Mike Barber, the tight end. We'll also see Mike Renfro. Burrow, wide left. Caster, wing right. Second down, nine. Campbell again. Again, only a one-yard gain. Gary Dunn, 67, and L.C. Greenwood, 68 with a tackle, and Jim Tunney warning uh, the aggressive 53, Dennis Winston, be cool. Let's look at the men who have opened the holes for Campbell to gain those two championships, rushing championships. Leon Gray, I think the best blast blocker in the NFL. David Carter's moved into left guard. The center, Carl Mock, he's a tough one. Right guard, Ed Fisher, one of the unsung heroes in that lineup. And Conway Hammond has moved over to right tackle. Ronnie Coleman into the game as a wing left. Third and eight. Basically a 10-man line for Pittsburgh. L.C. Greenwood is the premier pass rusher of this team. He just blew by number 70, Conway Heyman, and smothered Dan Pastorini. Pastorini just does not have enough mobility to get out of the way. Cliff Parsley into punt. He's in his own end zone with Theo Bell out at midfield for Pittsburgh. Parsley has done a great job punting in the playoffs. At the 40-yard line, tackled immediately. And almost a late hit by Courier. Carter Hartwig, 36, made the stop for Houston. A 30-yard kick, so Pittsburgh gets it back with great field position. And we have a timeout. Seven minutes left, first quarter. Houston, seven. Pittsburgh, nothing. Earl Campbell, two carries, two yards. What did you think? Well, I didn't think he had any trouble with his footing, but it's kind of hard to run when you got about eight or nine Steelers draped around your neck. Pittsburgh on the short punt puts it in play at the Houston 40-yard line. A complete 
Pittsburgh team and Bradshaw to the air. Complete. Lynn Swan at the 26. J.C. Wilson back in the game. The Houston defender. Got to believe that maybe Bradshaw is pulling a little of that fire out of his defensive team and right here attacks that pass gets it to Swan who for years has been his favorite receiver. Let's see how Swan gets open. Utilizes a quick turn and you see the slip right there. The slip by J.C. Wilson made it possible for him to be open. First down Pittsburgh's deepest penetration at the Houston 26. They trail 7-0. 622 left first quarter. Rocky Blyer flag down. Blyer bullying his way all the way to the 14 but I believe the penalty will go against Pittsburgh for procedure. Well yes. that's a big big penalty. They are already already in good field position that would have given him a first down inside the 15 Dick. But it's a motion penalty against the Steelers and that'll take it back to about the 31 yard line. Benny Cunningham did not appear to get set for the full second. Well, he jumped, and that's allowable if he can get back and get set for a full second before the snap. The men on the end of the line can move. Inside, if you lift your hand that way, the penalty is automatic. Swan to the right, as he always will be, and Stallworth to the left. First and 15 from the 30. Screen. Cunningham dropped the ball. Curly Culp, the veteran, was right there for Houston. On a screen play like that, the offensive line is supposed to let the defensive lineman through, but they accidentally screened Curly off too well. He saw the big tight end Cunningham slip into the outside, and even if Cunningham had caught the ball, I think Curly would have had him. He's a smart nose man. A lot of pressure on him today. He's got to control the middle of that line. And he's working, as you pointed out, against the man regarded as the best blocking center in the NFL and Mike Webster. Second down, 15. Bradshaw, two for seven thus far. And, of course, the one big interception. side number 69 and J.C. Wilson from the corner to make the tackle and also credit Greg Bingham 54 he's usually where the ball is the Where's Oilers the employing a four man rush there Dick as they put in an extra defensive lineman I think Bradshaw was hoping he could catch him in an all out rush and pop Franco through there often if you can do that you can get some good yardage but they read the play beautifully and made the stop third and 14 Breaks free, running room, 25, 20, 15, 10. He's all the way to the four-yard line. Twenty-five yards for the scrambling Bradshaw. One of the things you have to say about Terry Bradshaw is he can take what appears to be a loss and turn it into a big play. He does it right here with his running ability. And as we said, he has not run much this year. But in a big game like this, he will run. He'll go for every extra yard. You saw it right there. He dives out of bounds. They're down inside the five-yard line. First and goal. With apologies to our speller, but not to our artist. You'll see some of those caricatures today. and goal at the four. Harris, a yard, didn't appear that Harris really got off to a good start at all. And we saw that uh, play in the Rose Bowl often, using that tight end in motion and sending him into the hole. Here comes Sidney Thornton, number 38. Big, powerful, young fullback from northwestern Louisiana. Second leading rusher for the Steelers this year with 585 yards and six touchdowns. One of the things that Sidney Thornton brings to that lineup is some speed, and they do use him frequently outside. Maybe they're thinking of taking this play outside. Second and goal at the three. Pittsburgh trying to tie it up. Thornton. And an excellent. 
excellent play by you know who. It was Stringer and also Vernon Perry in on the stop. But Stringer the first hit from Ball State, one of the inside linebackers. They're trying to get Sidney Thornton off tackle and outside, but they get the great force inside by Bingham and Art Stringer, number 53, actually the man who got on his ankles, and then the clincher by number 32, Vernon Perry. Third and goal, a loss of a yard on that last play. Third and goal at the four. Swan and Stallworth both wide left. it appeared. 36 was the man who deflected the ball and the Steelers will have to go for the field goal. Dick, one of the other things that I have noticed in watching Terry Bradshaw on a, back, on a bad field, he seems to have the ability to keep his feet in his balance. Watch here. A lot of people are sliding around, but Bradshaw just kind of shuffles over there, gets a little extra time, and waits as a quarterback must until the last second to throw that pass, but a great play defensively to knock it away. Far to try a 21-yard field goal. Colt went to hold. It's good. Now the Steelers have scored for the first time. Let's go back. Jesse Baker, 75, was the man who deflected the pass in the end zone. The defensive end. We'll take another look at that when we come back. 7-3 Houston. There's a defensive end playing defensive back. Well, I think everyone is glad, especially Jesse Baker, that he was in that end zone. A most unusual position to be. Must have been knocked off that line down there trying to get, trying to get into position to do something. Unusual to see a big defensive end in coverage. Matt Barr settles for the 21-yard field goal, and now we'll kick it off to Carter Hartwig and Richard Ellender. 7-3, Houston leads it. Four minutes remaining in the first quarter in Pittsburgh. 22 degrees. Ellender. Down at the 18, Ellender has good speed, but he didn't seem to get it going, and he had some blocks downfield. I don't know whether that was the field or the fact that Ellender's playing with an injured hip. The defense for the Steelers. A defensive line in the forward portion of the steel curtain. L.C., you saw him on the sack earlier. Mean Joe Green, the building block of this defense. Gary Dunn. And on the outside, Big John Banaszak. Dennis Winston, Dirt Winston. Lambert. And, of course, on the outside, on the other side, Robin Cole back in the lineup. Jack Ham out for the playoffs with that ankle injury. First down at the 18 for the Oilers. Campbell. Robin Cole drops Campbell for a loss at the 16. Thus far, Campbell, three carries, has no yardage. Very, very aggressive defense. Number 56, Robin Cole, just coming across and tearing Campbell down. Campbell really has had no chance at all to use his cutting ability. They've been on him before he can get any kind of momentum, and he'd love to get those big backs running toward the sideline when they don't crunch it. Pastorini has not thrown the ball yet. Deep in his own end at the 15. Here's his first pass. Screen to Wilson. He's got blockers. 20, 25, 30, 35. 50, and he's all the way to the 45-yard line of Pittsburgh. A screen pass to Tim Wilson. And here come the Oilers. Rather amazing. If you would ask who the main man in this offense is going to be, everyone, of course, will say Earl Campbell. But it's Earl's blocking mate, number 45, Tim Wilson, that makes their first big offensive play. Gets some great blocking. Pulls out of a couple of tackles. And he seems to have... Great balance in maintaining his foot control on this field, too, Dick. But they're down into that slick end of the field. Let's see how they do down there. 41-yard play. Ron Johnson made the tackle. Here comes Campbell. And again, the Steelers' king on the Oilers' top runner. Drop him for a loss. Back at the 46, a loss of two. So Campbell now has carried four times, and he has a minus four-yard total. Ron Johnson and... Company of the Steelers, Mel Blunt, the all-pro corner, 
Donnie Schell, another all-pro season for him at safety, and J.T. Thomas filling in for Mike Wagner, and admirably so. Thomas back from that blood disorder that kept him out all of last year, been a valuable aid to that deep defense of Pittsburgh. They just sent Dwayne Woodruff onto the field and apparently got there too late. They sent him back off. Lambert said, too late. Get on out of here. Second and 12. right in that hole. Well, and one of the questions we ask at the top of the show is starting to be answered here, either because of the great defense or on that play, it just looked like Campbell couldn't get those cleats down to where he could afford to push off. Watch it for yourselves. Earl Campbell just not able to explode and not getting any room. Let's take a closer look at it, and maybe we can see what his problem is. Number 86, Barber. Oh, we're not looking at Campbell. We're, we're looking at a gang tackle on a on a defensive player there by a couple of offensive players. Robin Cole did a great job of fighting off the two Oilers. Third down, 11 from the Pittsburgh 45. Good protection. Going for Ronnie Coleman. Complete 17, 18 yard line, Ronnie Coleman. And what a throw by Pastorini. Lambert and Woodruff made the tackle. It's a 32-yard Houston game. Well, I can tell you, you're not supposed to throw that pass when you got two guys all over your receiver. But Pastorini throws it in there anyway, and Ronnie Coleman catches it. That's an unbelievable play. It's marked at the 13-yard line, 32-yard game. Right down the bottom of the well. Can't throw it any better than that. Well, there's nothing wrong with Pastorini's arm. That Ronnie Coleman, and there's nothing wrong with his catching ability either. He had that key reception in the late going at San Diego last week. 7-3, to three, Houston leads. Campbell, that's his best run of the day. Nets him about 4 to the 9. Lambert, the all-pro middle backer from Kent State. Quarterback in high school, he grew up just two miles from the Cleveland Browns training camp in Hiram, Ohio. Was always a Browns fan and a Jim Brown fan. Well, it should be said in Earl Campbell's benefit that that entire Steeler defense is keying on Earl Campbell. And their watchword today is stop number 34, stop Campbell. Second and six at the nine. Number 64 from Rhode Island, right there to make the hit. Campbell loses to the 11-yard line. It'll be third down and eight. Let's look at the surge of the lines, and obviously the Steelers getting the penetration down there deep. Joe Green, number 75. What a big play by that man. He's played well against the run this entire year. And that'll be the last play of the first quarter of this AFC championship game. One quarter in the book. The score here at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. The Oilers 7, the Steelers 3. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Maybe to get the first down, if not the touchdown, but they will go for it right here for the three points. 27-yard attempt by Frisch, who is 3-4-3 three three in the playoffs. Right down the middle for the veteran from Vienna, Austria. And we have a timeout in Pittsburgh. Almost a full 14 minutes left in the first half. Houston builds its lead back to seven. It's 10 to three. Now the owners went 72 yards to get Frisch in position for that 27 yard field goal. And now he'll kick it off to Larry Anderson, standing at the eight for the Steelers. Just underway in the second quarter, 10 to three, Houston leads it. Anderson at the 14, the 20, 25, 30, and to the 33 yard line as he slipped through an attempted tackle by Jeff Groth and finally stopped by Booby Clark. Now both quarterbacks seem to be getting a lot of time to throw, Merlin. Well, again, I think that's the footing factor, Dick. The defensive linemen have to initiate the action on a pass rush. And when you try and explode off that line of scrimmage and you can't keep your feet underneath you, you simply can't make those quick moves to get on that quarterback. I think it might mean that Bradshaw and Pastorini will go more to the pass than to the run. Bradshaw has Swan right, Stallworth left, and he is back to throw. And he completes it to Swan. First down at the 50. Swan's second catch. Our 
Brad Stringer made the tackle, number 53. Bradshaw threaded that through some Houston Oiler arms. And again, the thing that happens in the secondary, when that pass receiver knows where he's going to make his cut, and he can take that easy shuffling cut. Let's watch Swan here. Watch the shuffling cut. See the little tiny steps there? And the defender cannot make that instant reaction. He's a, he's a puncher, a counter puncher. He can't get back up there because he can't explode off those feet. He Plus, if he does ground. fall down, it's a touchdown instead of a 17-yard gain. Bradshaw will throw again. Incomplete. Tended for John Stallworth. Bradshaw, pretty good pressure on him that time. This telecast presented by authority of the National Football League. It's intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the National Football League is prohibited. Vocal point of Chuck Knoll, now 48 years old. His birthday yesterday, 11th season with the Steelers. As he started the decade of the 70s, he had just uh, come off a 1-13 and season and told his team, we're going to the Super Bowl eventually, Ben, and they had this choke through some smiles in that Steeler locker room. But he certainly has led them there, and now the only team with three Super Bowl wins. An audible by Bradshaw. He's down to three seconds on the clock and dumps it off to Harris. Good solid tackle by Vernon Perry. Oh, he is quite a defender. A gain of six, third and four. Bradshaw doesn't want to get into those long yardage situations. He doesn't want to allow them to put that extra two or single defensive back in there. And I think he saw right there what he thought would be an opportunity to get a quick drop to Franco and let him run a little bit. But the man of the hour, number 32, Vernon Perry. Great ball reaction here, protecting his zone, and an excellent open field tackle on Franco Harris. On third and four, Cunningham, the tight end, is split away out of your picture to the right. The flyer, first down. Out of bounds at the 36, Greg Bingham and J.C. Wilson on the tackle. No question that Houston's defense is trying to take away the outside re receivers, but they're giving them some room short. Right here, they're also giving them some room underneath. And, of course, Blyer taking advantage of that as he works against the very dependable Greg Bingham. He's led that team in tackles for seven years now. That kind of consistency is hard to beat. The Steelers are now on the rough part of the field. The footing will not be as sure from here to the goal line. Harris, Greg Bingham made the tackle at the 33-yard line just when Harris is about to put it in that second gear. We just got through talking about number 54, Greg Bingham. He is a tremendous player. Watch the action on the inside. Curly Culp working on Webster, trying to keep his position. Webster does a good job on Culp, but number 54 fills in, slides up admirably, makes the stop. It'll be second about seven yards to go. And Bradshaw would like another yard or two on that play. He'd like about second five, second six. Both wide receivers to the left. The slot. Blyer to the 30, and that'll bring up third down and a short four. Third and a short four. Curly Culp and Greg Bingham on the tackle. One of the things that Curly Culp brings to that position is great strength, but he has to give up strength to this Pittsburgh team. I tell you, their offensive line, one of the strongest in football, especially in, in Webster. And of course, both those guys bump over 500 pounds. And Culp, who's a strong man in his own right, really is, is not at that great an advantage when he goes against these guys. Third and four. Pittsburgh trailing 10 to three. Early in the second quarter. Bradshaw, Swan is open. Breaks a tackle. And finally down at the 19-yard line. First down, Pittsburgh. Fans are booing the tackle but did not hit Swan. Well we said that Terry Bradshaw was going to have to go more to the pass and his if on cue he has done exactly that with this drive and Swan of course doing his thing as he always does. He's nursing a hamstring and still able to make the nice cut able to control his balance and fight for that extra yard. And Swan well he does handle that ball like a magician. Bradshaw looking for Swan. Too long. J.C. Wilson.
Wilson who's back home here in Pittsburgh close friend of Tony Dorsett number 33 on the coverage well, no question that uh, Swan had beaten his man J.C. Wilson deep on that particular play let's see what kind of move he put on it just a little half stop there forces the reaction up and that gets deep and had the ball been on target it would have been a touchdown second and ten as Jim Smith comes in for Pittsburgh and Swan goes up and again the receivers on a day like today and especially at that end of the field by knowing where they're going and these Pittsburgh receivers especially they know this field they know where they can turn where they can stop and where they can ninth play of this drive Pittsburgh trying to tie it up Smith to the right Stallworth left on second and ten it's Blyer rudely at the 16 yard line is Andy Doris finishing his best season in the NFL seven years out of New Mexico State led the charge Chuck Knoll with a hundred regular season wins now and 112 overall since taking the job here in Pittsburgh he's built quite a football power but his team trails 10 3 9 55 remaining first half a big third and seven You can go from hero to goat in this game. Cunningham, good position, had time to turn, and Bradshaw, knowing he had that tall receiver out there, laid it up high, let him go get it. Well, and again, that end of the field is treacherous, and it's going to be especially treacherous for people who are not used to it and who have not played on this kind of turf. Actually, it looked like Perry was shielded by number 33, J.C. Wilson, his own man. We have to, have to give him a break on that. We didn't see that in the early going. Good replay. Carter Hartwick, 36, and Richard Ellender, 85, are deep for the Oilers as Matt Barr will kick it off. Nine thirty-three left in this first half. High but short. Hartwig at the 16, 20, and down at the 28-yard line. Wrestled down by Larry Anderson. Say, next Sunday, we've got a great lineup on NBC. We'll start the day with college basketball. Eighth-ranked Purdue takes on ninth-rated Syracuse in a national telecast. Then at three on the season premiere of NBC Sports World, basketball of a different kind. The magic and hilarity of Meadowlark Lemon, Wilt Chamberlain, the Bucketeers. Basketball wizardry at its very best. Then at 4.30, the excitement of the PGA Tour. Great golfers, great entertainers, the Bob Hope Desert Classic. That's all next Sunday on NBC. Pastorini sends Caster in motion. Dumps it out to Tim Wilson. Breaks one tackle, but is down at the 29. Little, if any, game. Dennis Winston and Ron Johnson collaborated on the stop. Neither team has really been able to establish a solid running game. Pittsburgh perhaps a slight advantage in that regard. Both teams have done their better work offensively through the year. Well, it, it's interesting to look back on the previous games between these two teams. The games that 
Pittsburgh has lost to Houston have been games that have been dominated by a Houston running game. Second and ten. Pastorini. What a catch by Renfro at the 40-yard line and a first down. Renfro left his feet too soon and still snared it. Pastorini did an excellent job of avoiding the rush. That's the most mobility we've seen out of him. You get a look at Joe Green, 75, and Banizak, 76. Banizak diving. Pastorini really wiped out as he got that one off. But that's another big play, and we've seen them all, three of them on the passing game so far for Houston, and that's where they've gotten all their yardage so far. And Renfro, even though he left his feet too soon, able to get his hands on the ball and a first down at the 41-yard line. First half. 10 10 tie. Campbell. A small opening, but it closed in a hurry as Robin Cole, 56, made the hit after a gain of a yard. Let's see what Campbell has done thus far. That is his eighth carry, his total yardage, zero. Well, there's no question that Campbell is not fully recovered from those injuries and it's bothering his performance but I would have to say too again you can't run when you got a bunch of Steelers draped around your neck and he's had them around his neck all day long. Pastorini facing a pass situation second down and nine. of the defensive teams in the NFL if they lose their number one linebacker on the outside as this team did and Jack Ham are in trouble. But these guys just slapped Dirt Winston in there for Jack Ham and he comes up with that kind of great play. The play before was Robin Cole number 56 doing the same thing on Campbell. Ken Burrow apparently has re-injured himself. He has not played. Guido Merkins is in as the third wide receiver. And a first down, or is it? It's at the 49-yard line, it's going to be very close to a first down. I believe he's got it. Guido Merkins, who is the third-string quarterback. But a flag is down. Apparently, Pastorini didn't get the ball off in the 32nd time. Dick, that's one of the things that can happen in someone else's stadium. When all of the crowd noise kind of seems to dominate you, and you often make mistakes like that. And also because you have to audibleize and yell more deliberately, which takes more time. Now, that's the kind of mistakes that Pittsburgh made when they played in the Astrodome, and it was one of the reasons that they lost the game down there, along with some great play by the Houston Oilers. 33-yard line, third and about 17. crazy as Blunt gets the fumble recovery but one thing for certain you'll never see Pastorini ever throw the ball better than he has thus far he has been perfect the Steelers have the ball we have timeout six minutes left in the first half first turnover for the Pittsburgh Steelers as Renfro had the first down tackled lost the ball no blunt recovered. It's a first down at the Houston 49 for the Steelers in a 10-10 tie. Cunningham, tight end, splits away. Both wide receivers, Swan and Stallworth, to the left. Franco gets four yards down to the 45. Going back to Dan Passerini, he is six for six, and he had another completion called back on a penalty. And we also talked about 
not only the fact that there were going to be turnovers, but the ball was going to be hard to hang on to. You see it right here. Renfro has a good grip on the ball, but he was caught changing hands with it. You saw him. He knew he was going to get hit, wanted to change hands, and it cost him the football. See right here. Changing hands, shifting it over, and he got hit by Donnie Shell, number 31, right in the middle of the changeover. Now Shell forced the fumble. Blunt recovered. Second and six at the 45. charge the Steelers in a 10 10 tie drive into Houston territory last week against the Miami Dolphins these Steelers just used their strength and power to blow the Dolphins off the ball they do it right on this play as they open a huge hole in the middle of the line and Blair gets through there for big yardage first down at the Houston 37 four and a half minutes remaining in the first half Quick toss to Harris. Out of bounds and a flag is down. Harris skipped out at the 30-yard line as he ran behind the block of 66, Ted Peterson. I think we're going to have a holding call over there. It's in an area where it's either a holding or there yeah. it is. Yeah. Jim Tunney making the call. And Bradshaw is not going to be happy with that. That's going to move him back a good 10 yards. Big 10 yards too. Again, they're down on the slick part of that field. That was a that was a tremendous explosive charge by the Pittsburgh offensive line on that first down run by Rocky Flyer. They went right Early, behind the run. Ten yards for first down. Kenny Cunningham guilty of the foul. First down 20 at the 47. As Houston comes in with a four-man front. Two linebackers and five defensive backs. Steve Corson, an injured ankle, has been replaced by Jerry Mullins. Bradshaw. Pulled in six. Swan was a picture of concentration as he waited for that ball and timed his jump. Bradshaw has the ball slightly off target. Swan adjusted beautifully. And right there, I think he makes the catch if he doesn't get hit on cue by number 33, J.C. Wilson. Wilson is out of the picture. He's beaten all together. Watch him come back in and hit Swan right at the last critical second. And Swan knew it. He said, I could have had that if you hadn't bumped me. He would have, too, right there. Another beautiful shot of it. What a this concentration on the ball. The way Swan hangs in the air, he is really an athletic marvel. Swan unhappy that he didn't come up with a touchdown, but that man made a fine defensive play. J.C. Wilson hits second and 20 at the 47. That's a, that's a big recovery. He was out of position. captain the guard number 57 through a key block the same kind of play we saw Houston run for big yardage earlier in the game again the play acting by the quarterback to pull the defensive line in Brazil had a chance at it expected Franco to cut back Franco just outsmarted him stayed to the outside and with the bad footing Brazil was beaten Franco was down there for a big gain but they do have a critical third down here and I don't think they're yet in field goal range for Van Park third and 10-10 tie. Clock down to 325 left in this half. Harris. First down at the 21. A patented Harris run picking his way through the middle of that Houston defense. Well, these Pittsburgh Steelers, they'll trap you when you get off the bus and you come into this town. And they run that inside trap better than any team in football. Right here, number 72, Mullins, gets the trap, makes it 
possible for Franco to cut back into the open territory. And as we said earlier, he's the finest cutback runner in football. Great job by Webster on Cope, keeping him off the backside. But look at that cutting ability by Franco Harris. On first down, Bradshaw. Into the end zone, Stallworth. John Stallworth. point far out of Colquitt's hold it looked like Swan was up there thinking that ball was thrown to him went over his head and into the waiting hands of Stallworth kick is good with two minutes and 34 seconds left in the second quarter the champion Pittsburgh Steelers have taken the lead 17 to 10 in New York as the Oilers near the end of the first half trailing 17-10. They're still better off than they were a year ago. A year ago they were losing 14-3 when Ronnie Coleman fumbled this ball. It set up a touchdown pass of Bradshaw to Swan made it 21-3. The Steelers went on to a 31-3 halftime lead. Let's go back to Pittsburgh. Okay, Bryant, 17 points scored by the Steelers in the last minute of the first half last year, and the Oilers want to protect against that now, and we're in about the same situation. 2.34 left in the half. The Oilers trail 17 to 10 as Barr kicks it off. Good kick. Ellender at the 10. And he's down at the 29-yard line. Zach Valentine, 54, rookie linebacker, made the stop. It's been a game so far of big plays, and this is the kind of patented throw and catch that Pittsburgh has had from Bradshaw and Stallworth throughout this year. Looked like maybe it wasn't going to be that kind of day, but it has exploded in that way for them. Watch Stallworth coming on his own into the end zone. Again, total concentration on that football, thinking of nothing else but catching it. They have the touchdown. I was interested, too, in watching Bradshaw, who was looking left all the time, and at the last moment almost stepped left and threw right for the score. Perfect six for six passing. Gives it to Campbell. And Campbell is hit at the 30 yard line. White, White, number 78, the veteran defensive end, made the tackle. The Houston Oilers have changed their offensive philosophy. They've gone to two, two tight ends and Campbell a single back in the backfield. They'd like to get Campbell off the corners and isolated on the defensive backs, but he was unable to get rolling that time. Only a short gain puts them in a long yardage situ situation on second down. And we have the official two-minute warning here at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh where the score reads Pittsburgh 17, the Oilers 10. Number 77, Steve Corson, leaving the field with an injury. Corson replaced by the veteran Jerry Mullins, and Mullins on almost the first play through a great trap block that helped set up that drive to the leading touchdown by the Steelers. They're in front 17 to 10. Boy, the rushing totals are significant. Campbell unable to gain, and it's second and nine with two minutes left at the 30. Blitz. And the Oilers, fortunate that ball fell in an empty patch of Three Rivers carpet. That's a double safety blitz. Number 24, JT Thomas, and number 31, Donnie Shell, both blitzing to the outside. Pastorini just doesn't have enough people to pick it up, and you saw it right there. That was 24, I think, JT. And had he been able to get that up, it's number 31, Donnie Shell, coming from the outside. Watch Shell right here. Hits Pastorini's arm just as he starts to deliver the ball. Right there. Had Pastorini thrown a fraction of a second sooner, he had Mike Barber open, it would have been a first down. Wide open. Third and nine, and again, the Steelers have an 11-man front. Now they back off. from Louisville has the ball and with 148 left the Steelers have a chance to pad the lead. That looked like an interception as soon as it left his hand. The ball never should have been thrown. I'm sure that Pastorini knows that and that's the first bad pass 
that's he's thrown in this half. Timeout. Pittsburgh with plenty of time to add to a 17-10 lead. Rookie Dwayne Woodruff, number 49, had one interception during the year. He saved some big plays for the playoffs in Pittsburgh, and this could be a very important part of this game with 1.48 left in the first half. Pittsburgh has scored a quick turner about on the interception. Now they go for more. Franco Harris. And an excellent play made by number 59, Ted Washington, the outside backer from Mississippi Valley. And Harris has stopped for no gain. Let's, let's go back a play and look at the critical action. You see Mike Barber trying to save a little bit of pressure on his quarterback. Cuts the legs right out from underneath the rush. But the ball there, and I think what happened, Dick, they suckered Pastorini into a back to live action. Harris on the little checkoff pass is down at the 50-yard line. Pittsburgh calls time. Tani is going to tick off a few seconds because, in, in essence, Pittsburgh did gain an advantage there. Tunney was saying, start the clock, but the clock was not starting, at least the one up on the scoreboard. Now they run the clock at 41, 39. That's what they've done. It's down to 34. On second and long, Harris again gets to the 43 of Houston. Greg Bingham running into one of the officials and goes over to see if he's all right. He is. Fourth down, and we we'll make that third down in about uh, eight. Matt Barr, the rookie from Penn State, anticipating a possible long field goal try. 26 seconds remaining as Pittsburgh exercises another timeout. Pittsburgh has demonstrated the ability to move the ball down the field, but still, the story of this first half is a story of big plays, Dick. The big interception that started off for Houston, and their whole productivity based on throwing the football on offense, not on running it. They have really been shut down. And Bob Phillips, the headmaster of the Oilers, has to be concerned. Earl Campbell has been held to literally nothing in this first half by that steel curtain. Say tonight, folks, on the big event, dramatic three-hour world premiere, Carl Molden as Skag. He's a Pittsburgh steel worker, a man who fights for what he believes in and believes in his family. A story of survival and a lot more. It's been critically acclaimed, those who have seen the early editions, the preview editions. Why don't you join us tonight? Carl Molden is Skag tonight on NBC. Well, I have to enjoy Carl Mullen as an actor and get my work in as a thespian. I enjoy watching him work. He's really a pro. 44-yard line. Pittsburgh has the ball in Houston territory. Third and nine. And look at that statistic. The National Football League's top rusher held to a minus two in this first half. Makes you wonder if Bum Phillips won't go to maybe some fakes to Campbell and give the ball to someone else the way Pittsburgh is keying on him. Well, they're going to have to do something because uh, what's happened right now is Pittsburgh's balance and Pittsburgh's strength is beginning to pay off big for them. The clock is being wound down to 21 seconds, and that is the official time. 21 seconds. Now Jim Tunney indicating the clock. He's actually uh, ticked off another three seconds down to 21. That has to do with that delay of two plays ago that we talked about. Bradshaw, third and nine. another first down to get that field goal. Harris to the 40 and out of bounds. He may have the first down at the 34. Harris has done it again with 13 seconds and he also stopped the clock. We talked about Franco Harris's ability to run on this field and he continues to amaze me. How is it that he can run at full speed and keep his balance and make the cuts and Earl Campbell, uh, who, who is one of the most unbelievable runners I have ever watched carry a football, cannot keep his feet underneath him today. I think it's just a difference of style. The fact that Franco runs straight up, has his feet on the ground, and has control of everything he does. Earl Campbell runs with that forward body lean. Well, he's laid almost out on his stomach when he's running at his best. 13 seconds left, Bradshaw to block. left and here comes the field goal unit for Pittsburgh Terry Bradshaw delivering that ball right on target but he also has to pay a price for that watch what happens to Bradshaw after the fact we'll get the chance to see it here it'll be a 
a 40-yard attempt, as you see Bradshaw, the courage that quarterback must have, Doris dumping him. Seven seconds remaining in the half, and a time has been called by Pittsburgh. That's their final timeout, an unusual one called. Apparently, the right personnel not on the field for that field goal kicking team. There was a little hesitation by Bradshaw, Merlin. You felt that Terry, with seven seconds left, wanted one more play before the field goal team came on. Well, he certainly has time maybe to get one quick one, but uh, obviously they're playing it safe right here. It was last year, the final minutes of the first half, so critical to the game. Pittsburgh scored 17 points. Brian talked to you about that in the last minute last year, and now they're trying to get 10 points in the last three minutes this season. I think what might have happened on that last play is the kicker's job, one of his jobs is to count the number of players on the field. It looked like Pittsburgh may have had 12 men on the field, and of course, 12 men is a familiar theme for these Houston Oilers. They'd have loved to have seen that. It's helped them to win two of their games during this season, including last week against San Diego when they kicked the field goal. Chargers had 12 men on the field, penalty to the half-yard line. They ran for the touchdown, and that proved to be the difference in the game. This will be a fairly long attempt on that that slick surface, 40 yards. Bar's longest this season, 46 yards. They can now go into the dressing room down by only a touchdown. There's still two seconds left, and Houston will have one more play before the gun. Well, big emotionally because it would have given them a 10-point lead, and, and also they fought down the field under what appeared to be very adverse circumstances, fighting the clock. Bradshaw doing an excellent job of using his time and using his receivers well, getting them out of bounds, getting the clock stopped. But they didn't get the payoff. They didn't get the points at the end of the drive. Now the Oilers will have that final play. See what Bum Phillips has ordered. Both Renfro and Castor are left. Barber, the tight end, anchors the line to the right. And Campbell gets one final call. And down he goes after a short game. Lauren Taves, 51, made the tackle, and that's the end of the first half in Pittsburgh. Struck quickly and early on Vernon Perry's 75-yard touchdown with an interception, but Pittsburgh came back in the second quarter and lead at the half by seven. With the score tied, 10-10, following a turnover, Terry Bradshaw goes to the air, finds the Steelers' most valuable player this past season, John Stallworth, touchdown. The Steelers take a 17-10 halftime lead today's AFC Championship game. Hello again, everyone. I'm Brian Gumbel. Welcome back to NFL 79. Halftime today's game, it's 17-10. Steelers enjoying a better than 2-1 to -one advantage in total yardage so far. We'll have halftime highlights and a flashback to the old days of the AFL. All that and more for these messages from your local state. Carl. Time for today's AFC Championship game. The Pittsburgh Steelers out in front of the Houston Oilers, 17-10. Today's game, the 20th AFC Championship, should say the 20th American Football Championship. Back in the old days, the AFL used to get together for some slam-bang affairs. Lenny Dawson, a part of many of those affairs. When the American Football League first began 20 years ago, most of the teams played in stadiums like this one. Rickety old high school or college fields that barely held 25,000 fans. Jefferson Stadium, Frank Ewell Field, the Polo Grounds. Most of these places are now just memories. But on those fields, a league was born. And some of the most exciting championship games ever were played on them. The very first American Football League championship was on New Year's Day, 1961, with the Houston Oilers defeating the then Los Angeles Chargers 24-16. In 1962, my team, the Dallas Texans, faced the Oilers. The game went into overtime, and for some reason, our captain, Abner Haynes, won the toss, but chose to kick off. Somehow we survived, and when Tommy Brooker kicked the winning field goal, football's longest game, 77 minutes, was over, and we had won 20 to 17. We were a tired, but very happy, and very relieved football club. 
1964, the Chargers took on the Buffalo Bills and were in command until Buffalo linebacker Mike Stratton made what is regarded as the most famous hit in AFL history. It knocked Chargers star Keith Lincoln out of the game. Without him, San Diego sputtered and Buffalo became the new champ. By 1966, those Dallas Texans I used to play with were called the Kansas City Chiefs. We went up to Buffalo for the championship and beat the Bills to earn the right to play in the first Super Bowl. One of the greatest individual efforts I ever saw was Mike Garrett's fourth quarter touchdown run. That plus two touchdown passes I threw were more than enough to win 31 to seven. Years later, in 1968, the New York Jets and Oakland Raiders played perhaps the best game in the AFL Championship Series. It was a seesaw battle that wasn't decided until the final minutes when Joe Namath hit Don Maynard with a winning touchdown pass. The Jets triumphed 27 to 23, then went on to win the Super Bowl. In 1969, the Chiefs became the first wild card team to go all the way to the Super Bowl and win. First, we beat Oakland in the championship thanks to a great defensive effort and some timely plays from our fullback, Robert the Tank Holm. Our 17-7 victory sent us to the Super Bowl and we beat Minnesota. But winning the last AFL game ever played made us just as proud. In 1970, the leagues merged. The AFL became the AFC. The stadiums were now plush and modern, holding 50,000 or more. But the games were just as exciting, the rivalries even more intense. Between 1970 and 79, three franchises dominated play, Miami, Oakland, and Pittsburgh. Not once in those 10 years was there a title game without at least one of those teams participating. Miami won the first of three consecutive AFC championships in 1971 when they beat the Baltimore Colts 21 to nothing. The most memorable play of the game was number 40, Dick Anderson's interception return for a touchdown. No less than six other Dolphins threw perfect blocks to clear a path to the end zone. After Miami's reign ended, a team from a much colder climb, the Pittsburgh Steelers took over. They beat the Raiders twice for the AFC crown, once in Oakland, the second time during a frigid Pittsburgh snowstorm in 1975. Pittsburgh's string was finally broken in 1976 by the Raiders, but Oakland stayed on top for only one year. Then quarterback Craig Morton and the miracle Denver Broncos dethroned them in the 1977 AFC Championship, 20 to 17. Denver's reign was just as brief. In 1978, Pittsburgh regained the AFC title by trouncing Houston 34 to five. Today, these same two teams meet for the 20th AFL-AFC Championship game. The 1960 winner's share of $1,000 has grown to almost $10,000. Whoever earns it today will be capping off a 20-year heritage of a great pro football series. Indeed, a great pro football series. 20 years of American football championships. The Oilers and Steelers following in that tradition today. We've got a good one going. Steelers coming. As we're ready for the second half, Pittsburgh leading 17 to 10. There's the report card. First 30 minutes. Incredible that the best rusher in the NFL for this season, the fourth best rushing team in the NFL, held to two yards rushing in the first half. And those 90 yards, 99 yards, that's even deceptive because most of that on three big pass plays, one screen play. Bradshaw and his Steelers, on the other hand, have grounded out pretty well. 251 yards total offense, and it's pretty well balanced, as you can see. Are you prorate that for a game? That's over 500 yards in offense for Pittsburgh, whereas Houston would be under 200. Houston will get the ball first. Had it not been for Vernon Perry's touchdown with an interception, game would not be uh, in Houston's grasp. At 17-10, they're still in it. Barr hits it high. Ellender wants it at the nine. Richard Ellender to the 22-yard line. Ellender not running at full speed. He's carrying a painful hip injury. Lauren Taves, who has played an excellent game, he's made four tackles, most of those on special teams or special third-down situations. 
Let's see who's in that starting backfield now for Houston. Is Campbell in there? Wilson, we see his number 45. And as they break out of the huddle, well, yes, Campbell is there. So Bum Phillips did not go to Rob Carpenter. There was some speculation on the press level that Carpenter might be in for Campbell. Tim Wilson, and he gets out to the 25-yard line, a gain of three. But the interesting thing on the first play, it was it was Campbell blocking for Wilson, not Wilson blocking for Campbell. Maybe they've changed their philosophy about who is going to carry the ball and who is going to block. Again, Ken Burrow, one of the three key players for Houston that was injured last week, has not seen any duty today. And Renfro is the wide receiver to the left. Richard Castor, wing to the right, tight end is Barber, second and seven. Biggest gain of the day out to the 32 yard line and close to a first down. Very close to a first down, as you said, Dick. And Earl Campbell has got to be thrilled. He finally got a little bit of daylight, gets away from Banizak, 76. Number 56, Robin Cole, gets tackled, almost slid for the first down. They're going to measure it. Watch Jack Lambert, 58, steps in and slides to the open area. Sees Campbell breaking clean and makes a very sure tackle on Earl's legs. It will be a Houston first down. We're pleased to have Sam Retigliano, the Cleveland Brown head coach, with us in our NBC booth. And congratulations to Sam on his honor, AFC Coach of the Year. And one of the comments he made to us was that on top of everything else that Pittsburgh does well, they just tackle so well. You think you've got a big play going, and you saw Lambert, that little extra that might have saved a long gainer. First down. has been around a long, long time, but he has played the running game this year as well as he ever has, and you cannot play the running game and Earl Campbell any better than that. Isolation on number 75 right there. Just beats the block by Fisher on the line of scrimmage and nails Campbell in the backfield. Joe Green, many times an all-pro, and that was a big hit. Brings up second down, 12. Renfro incomplete. Renfro had gotten behind Mel Blunt, but the pass was wobbly and short. Pittsburgh going to the blitz again. Donnie Shell, number 31, blitzing to try and put pressure on Pastorini. Pastorini really is their trump card right now. You get a quick look at Renfro. Renfro had enough room, could have made the catch. The ball thrown short, I think because of the pressure caused up by the blitz on Pastorini. Zero, Ken Burrow coming back from the locker room. On that same pattern, Burrow has better deep speed. Third and 12. First possession of this second half. And that's Rob Carpenter in motion. Carpenter hit immediately at the 33 by Mel Blunt. And, so, and Blunt still after the Oilers. And there's a penalty flag. And someone is going to be hit with a personal foul. It looked as if Blunt were the guy that was causing the trouble. I think Blunt was just trying to hold Carpenter so he wasn't going to get in the fight with Lambert, who apparently had hit him quite late, but well below before the whistle snapped. And again, Dick, you've got to understand that these teams are very emotional on the field. Double foul, unfortunately, I found out 26 points, 47 dust. Well, they're going to hit the double foul. I think Blunt. I think Blunt was trying to be a peacemaker. That's not his usual role. Rob Carpenter and Mel Blunt, the man with the ball, the man tackling the ball carrier, hit with a foul. No harm, really, in that penalty. It brings up fourth down on the dead ball foul, and uh, ten yards plus for Houston. So Leo Bell drifts back into for a 29-yard line is Bum Phillips putter Cliff Parsley. He'll deliver from about the 23. Had only one punt in the first half. It was a short kick. Short again. Bell on the run. Fumble! And who's got it? Bell or the Oilers? They both have their hands on it. The ruling is Houston. The Oilers get a break, and they needed something of that sort. Trailing 17 to 10, Bell coming up to catch that dying quail, 
and fumbled it forward to the Oilers. It appeared that David Carter covered the ball. It's almost as if this were in the script. Coming up to try and field that ball on a cold day when the ball is slick, Theo Bell might have been well advised to let it go. Watch it again as it comes down short, and Bell either has to get up quick enough to get position or stay away from that football. Big turnover, a chance for Houston to do something here. Now on the muff, it's first down at the 41. Pass to Rainey, play action. Goes for Barber, incomplete. Barber trying for the one-handed catch as the pass was high, and he took quite a pop from Mel Blunt. Steve Furness at the other end was pressuring Pastorini. The battle between these two teams is as physical as any battle in football. Pastorini hit as he gets the ball. Barber hit as he reaches for the football. Mike Barber, a fine tight end, operating with two sore knees out on the field. He's given it everything he can. And boy, you can't help but remember the shot he took last year from Wagner that put him in the hospital with an operation. When the plane got here yesterday, he went to the hospital to see Wagner, who was in the hospital. Wagner just checked out, but that's the kind of guy Mike Barber is. Second and ten. Pastorini trying to call out his audible, and Campbell is tackled immediately by Joe Green. Green is just overpowering his man. the steel curtain and Joe Green carries the keys he opens all the doors well Joe Green is playing against the fine guard and Ed Fisher who's had a great year but somehow the there must be some extra oxygen for him during these playoff games he has really got the butt, butt blood pumping and the adrenaline pumping for this one four down 14 at the Pittsburgh 45 unable to grab the ball Lambert made the tackle or made sure that Perkins was down had he caught it and that Steeler defense gets a standing ovation three plays after the fumble of Bells was recovered at the 41 Houston has to kick on fourth and 14 Perkins trying to run with that football before he got it comfortably into his hands. Parsley to kick. Bell will get another chance. That's the best kick today by Parsley. To the 7. 10. And down at the 14-yard line. Fine hit made by number 50, Daryl Hunt, the former star at Oklahoma. The sad thing, that's the first good field position that Houston's had all day. They've lost the opportunity. 11.48 left in the third quarter. The Steelers lead by seven. Pittsburgh Pirates' Willie Stargell, he came in disguise as a Houston Oiler fan. You know where his heart is, right here in the Steel City. Well, they build it as the city of champions, and the Oilers uh, would like to change part of that championship image if they can unseat him today. But so far, the Steelers doing pretty well to, to keep their reputation intact. Bradshaw sets his line at the 14. First possession for the Steelers. Wire and Harris behind him. Stallworth left, Swan right. Harris out to the 16 and pinned there after a gain of two. Greg Bingham 54 with a hit. Frustrating day for Earl Campbell. He knew the road to Pasadena went through Pittsburgh. Well, a lot of big chuck holes here at Three Rivers. He just can't get himself at full speed. We're having a few mechanical problems here in the stadium. The phones on the Houston side, the phones that carry their information to and from the press box have gone out. And the officials, in a ruling that, that really stands for equity on the field, have ordered the Pittsburgh coaches to put their telephones down. So there are no headsets. They're using signals on the sideline to communicate. Back to the good old days, second and eight. Liar hit, and he gains nothing. Good defensive surge by the Oilers. Andy Doris, 69, 53 Stringer, and 54 Bingham all in on the play. Well, they must have cleared up the problem. I see George, George Perlis and some of the other coaches putting their headsets back on. 
Bum doesn't wear one of the headsets. Feels it, it interferes with his concentration on the game. But most of the, assist, the assistant coaches, as you see, you see them putting on their headsets over there, will be in communication with the coaches upstairs who have a better view of the game. Third down and seven for the Steelers at their 17. Pittsburgh leading 17 to 10 and Bradshaw's first throw of the second half scrambling and hit down at the nine yard line as Doris made the play again. He was drafted by Cleveland in 73 played for a while at New Orleans was kind of scrambling for work but he's really found himself in Houston and has had an outstanding year at left end. That's the third sack of the day and that's very important because it backs the punter into the end zone. Any mistake down there is a possible three points or maybe even a seven point maybe a safety. You don't want to make a mistake when you're backed into your own end zone. Houston should come up with good field position again. Colquitt takes a snap from Webster and drives a beauty. Ellender all the way back to his 45 has some blockers at the 50. Down he goes. One man ran right through all that blocking wall. Robin Cole number 56 and not only stripped the interference but made the hit. One of the questions that might be asked why is Ellender in there. We'll talk about that after we get back from commercial 46 yard kick under pressure by Colquitt. The Oilers had the ball at midfield. <laughs> it looks like a Pittsburgh pistol against a Houston cannon. Now the reason that they have a tube out there is so that that live heat or very hot flame there doesn't come out and burn anyone. You, your hands get a little numb. You stick them down thinking you get them warm. If it's too hot you might burn them. Houston at its own 49 yard line. 946 left in the third quarter. The Oilers trail 17 10. This is Campbell. He can't get outside and a flag is down at the 50 yard line. You saw the speed of Ron Johnson. And there's an indication too that Campbell isn't 100 percent. You won't see him do that very often. Got to wonder what the call is whether it's Campbell for pushing in the face or something into the face mask by Ron Johnson or Blunt actually probably on the face mask yeah. against yeah. Pittsburgh. There was Johnson over there. Shot right here Campbell when you get him outside get him isolated one on one on a back. Normally, when he is healthy, there is no con. There you see it, right there. He just grabbed that right hand right on the mask. I think maybe Earl knew he had the yardage. Why hurt yourself on that? Set? He's getting a lot smarter. Grabbing the face mask during the run. Five yards. First down. First down. Actually, they marked off a seven-yard penalty. The line of scrimmage was the 49. They marked it off from the spot of the foul, which was the 49 of Pittsburgh. So it's two yards plus the five on the penalty and a first down. Tim Wilson. And he uses a straight arm and gets out of bounds at the 43 into the Steeler bench. It'll be second and nine for Houston. The Oilers trail the favorite Steelers 17 to 10. In case you joined us late, Vernon Perry, the star of last week's victory at San Diego for Houston, intercepted a Bradshaw pass in the first couple of minutes of the game, went 75 yards for a touchdown to give Houston an early lead. Pittsburgh kicked the field goal. Oilers came back to kick a field goal to make a 10-3. Then Pittsburgh, in the final portions of the first half, scored of touchdowns to take the 17-10 win. Two touchdown passes to Swan and to Stallworth. Play action. Barber incomplete. And what a hit by J.T. Thomas, number 24. That's the kind of pass that quarterbacks have to apologize for. He hung that ball up there. Barber had to wait and wait for it. Gave the defenders time to get over and they really made him pay the price. Watch the ball hang a little bit. And while he's waiting for it, J.T. Thomas covered the ground and just destroyed any opportunity to catch it. Barber is open. The ball needs to be thrown quicker. The timing off, and again, I think you'd have to probably lay that off on Pastorini's injury. He hasn't practiced much in the last two weeks. J.T. Thomas playing for the injured Mike Wagner made the defensive play. Third and eight. protection. This is Carpenter at the 40 and he twists down to the 37. That's not enough for the first down. We'll bring up fourth and three. 
Jack a little Lambert. hesitation over there. Excuse me, Dick. A little hesitation. They may go for it here. They haven't had good field position except for the two times they've gotten the ball in this half. One time on the fumble and then this time. And Bomas, he's going to go for it. It's a big Why Now that's, you talk about your riverboat gambler. There he is. Fourth down and a long two yards. Normally, this wouldn't be a bad gamble because Earl Campbell picks up the yardage in this situation, but not the way Campbell has run today. going to be very close. Campbell, that was one of those patented lower the shoulder and fight for a yard, and a flag is down. Well, and that's the kind you hate to see right there. Got to get a little extra. Apparently, Pittsburgh, with all the noise here, Houston didn't get the playoff in its 32nd allotment. That's twice today. Now, Bum almost has to punt. Second is if Bum Phillips has gambles. And of course, we looked at that gamble he made last week when he refused the three points and went for the seven, provided himself the winning margin in that game against San Diego. It looked like the gamble here, which was one that would be questioned by many coaches, was going to be successful, only to be taken away by a delay of game penalty. Theo Bell at the 10. Parsley it toward the sidelines and it dies out of bounds around the 20 yard line. They mark it at the 21. So Parsley does not get a good kick. He had been kicking brilliantly in the first two games of this play in, in the playoff series. 824 remaining in the third quarter. Pittsburgh leads 17-10. Pittsburgh has the ball at the 20 yard line. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. KMOL TV Channel 4, San Antonio. Now the Steeler defense holds Houston after they lost the ball in a fumble, did the Steelers, and then on the punt started at the 50 yard line. But the steel curtain too tough, and Pittsburgh leading 17 10 now has improved its field position out to the 20 yard line. Harris to the 23 yard line. It'll be second and seven. Curly Culp, Robert Brazil on the tackle for the Oilers. The responsibility very clear cut for the Houston defense. They'd like to get another turnover or at worst force a punt from deep in Pittsburgh's own territory. But one of the things that has always amazed me about Pittsburgh is their ability to drive the ball long distances to control the football. And they've done it today with third down conversions. They're going to try and do that again, eat the clock, maintain their lead in the second half. Bradshaw has thrown the ball well. The play action, screen, and Cunningham drilled by Art Stringer, who read that screen very well, and it's a loss of a couple. Back to the 21. to watch the play from the end zone. The play was never really there. It looked like it was read too well to be anything but a, a short shot. Stringer just doing a great job. Also, Curly Culp read it from the inside. We saw him break up one earlier in the day, I believe, on the same play. Coming back on this side now, Webster, number 52. He's the man that they like to get in front of the play. He did his job, but unfortunately, the other linebacker, Stringer, was there to cut him down. Webster, fifth round pick out of Wisconsin. All pro. It's now third and nine. There's your open man, Cunningham, incomplete. He trapped the ball. So Cunningham, who probably would not have had the first down at that spot, they needed to get the ball across the 30. But that's academic. It's fourth down and nine. Incomplete pass. Houston is in this game because of big plays. The turnover and seven points that Vernon Perry got for him early. And then the big pass plays of Pastorini. They've had two chances here in the second half. They've not converted on either one. I think they've got to get something going here pretty quick or it's going to be too late. 6.50 left in the third quarter. Colquitt to Ellender. Ellender stands at the 40. Another good kick. What a beauty. 30, 20. Oh, Ellender may have touched the ball and decided I better knock it out of bounds. 
65 yards. His longest of the year was 66. Boy, field position really turned about on that kick by Colquitt. <laughs> and you saw Colquitt's reaction. He kicked that ball exactly where he wanted to kick it. Houston starts deep in its own end. Have those light aircraft carrying the banners of advertisement. There are three of them overhead and at times dangerously close to one another. It does not seem a wise choice to have so many planes in such a limited area. 50,000 fans beneath them. We've had some near tragedies in that regard in other cities. On the field, Houston now pinned back in its own end after it enjoyed field position on the last two possessions. Pastorini throws for Renfro and throws it away. Blunt had Renfro beautifully covered one on one. Boy, he is tough. He just throws a blanket around his man on that one to one coverage. A chance to watch the rush on Pastorini and the kind of pressure he's going to get. The play action fools people momentarily. Pastorini has the early go, but you see the black shirt starting together. Pastorini did unload that football, and wisely so. George Perlis, defensive coach on the sideline, jumping for that possible catch. <laughs> it was only 25 feet over his head. That's why Perlis has a defensive line. Pastorini started out six for six. Again, play action. Dumps it off to Campbell. Looks for a block. And Earl bounces out to the 25-yard line and a first down. And Pastorini is down. As he delivered the ball, he was hit by Steve Furness. We watched Pastorini being carried out of this stadium earlier in the year on a stretcher. Dan is up now, but he really gets leveled. And, of course, the great concern from the Oiler bench is because of his injuries, how much of a beating is he going to take? And his offensive line's done a pretty good job of protecting him today, but hard to protect against the Steeler rush. You can see the tackle here by Furness. It's not a vicious tackle. It's just that that frozen carpet, when Pastorini falls, that's where it hurts. It wasn't the tackle itself, but the double penalty on the artificial surface. They're escorting Pastorini off to the sideline now. You see again what hit him there. They're asking him about his injury. We may have to see Gifford Nielsen, who played very well, although conservatively for Pastorini in that victory last week. Bum Phillips out to talk to his quarterback. But what a tough assignment in this 26 degree weather when you haven't handled the football since pregame warm ups over two hours ago, and then to come into a crucial game like this just to be warm, much less accurate and efficient. And of course, the difference, as we said in this game, the big plays have come from Pastorini from his throwing arm got to wonder if they will give Gifford Nielsen the opportunity to go for some of those big ones. Pastorini being attended to out at the 31 yard line and helped off the field and Gifford Nielsen will come in. Well it's appropriate I think to talk about Pastorini's courage. A lot of people can't play when they're hurt when they're in pain. Pastorini has had to do it throughout his career and has played extremely well extremely well today under pressure. And you pay a price for that as you see here. Again, I think you're right. Furness really not trying to injure Pastorini, just trying to get him stopped. And that hard turf, the whiplash part of it, appeared to be the most damaging thing that happened to Dan on that play. It is a first down at the 24-yard line. And Nielsen going to throw the ball right off the bat to Wilson on a little screen. And Wilson gets good yardage, almost a first down to the 34-yard line. And Pastorini, not because of the completed pass, but he says, I feel a lot better now. Get me back in. Well, Pastorini and Bum Phillips, that entire organization, are going to feel better if they can get the ball down the field and get it in the end zone. They can if they can continue to control it as they have on these last two downs, getting those first downs, working themselves down the field. It's a free down for Pastorini, second and less than a yard. Campbell. Bubble. And oh, the Oilers get it at the 48-yard line. Oh, when they created this game and made it an oblong ball, they brought unpredictability into the game. And there's a case where the Steelers had it surrounded 
and almost as if it had a magnetic force that was drawn to the one oiler in the area, Mike Renfro. Well, I've heard it said I'd rather be lucky and good. The Oilers are lucky. The ball stripped away right there. Linebacker Cole, I think, stripped it. Two Steelers had a chance, but Renfro right on top of it. Big play. Watch the ball stripped away from the outside. That's Robin Cole right there, just stripped it away from him. And they had a chance. Great play by Renfro. Five Steelers and Renfro, and Renfro gets the lucky bounce. First down at the 48 and a half. 17 to 10, Pittsburgh leads. We have four and a half left in the third quarter. Renfro is knocked down, and that'll be a penalty on Mel Blunt. Blunt used his left forearm or elbow, and Renfro with a contact fell, and that drew the flag at the 36-yard line. Well, on the sideline, again, when that ball is in the air, you cannot touch those receivers. You hear the reaction of the crowd, but I don't think Mel Blunt is going to argue with it. He realizes that he tapped him. What's the one-on-one -on -one situation here? Renfro down the sideline, the contact right there. No question about it. Good call by the official. And Renfro showed the hit, but didn't play act the thing. He, I think he knew the official was close by, the flag would be coming. They called it an illegal chuck. It appeared to me that the ball was already in the air and should have been interference, but it's a five-yard penalty, and it takes it to the 47 of Pittsburgh. I'm surprised, too. I thought the ball was in the air, too, Dick. Houston, Dan Passerini back in the saddle. The Oilers trail by seven late in the third quarter. Campbell. And even with the power of Campbell, you could see he's just not generating that early speed that he possesses when really healthy. Well, they're trying to run in behind the blocking ability of Leon Gray, number 74, and they're just not getting those Pittsburgh defensive linemen and linebackers off the ball. Pittsburgh is controlling the line of scrimmage, and that makes it awfully tough. So Steve Baumgartner, number 63, using his helmet as a chair. Second down, eight. Passerini to Renfro. First down at the 23. Jack Lambert made the tackle, and the Oilers are generating a long march. Except for the early drive that really was a two-play drive, the screen pass and a long pass. This is the first time they've had a sustained offense all day. Here it is again. Again, off the play action to Campbell, and what a bullet thrown by Passerini catching... Renfro in the seam, Lambert drifting back to make the tackle. First down at the 23-yard line. Renfro had the touchdown catch that proved to be the winner last week in San Diego. Wilson, and he powers to the 20-yard line, a gain of three, second and seven. L.C. Greenwood, 68, White White, 78, made the tackle. Jack Lambert got up limping noticeably. He's had some ankle problems, is wearing high top shoes to try and protect those legs of his, but they don't want to lose him. He's a main man down there. You almost have to drag him off the field. That spot on his ankle is from the stickum that they use to try to help grab tacklers and possible interceptions. Nothing to do with the injury. The throw is incomplete to Caster, and he was wide open as Ron Johnson playing Caster very loosely. In fact, that's the first time Pastorini has gone in Caster's direction, but he was wide and out of bounds incomplete. Third and seven. Donnie Shell complaining about some of the activity near the line of scrimmage. Watch him right here. He's working on Barber. Barber a little unhappy with the way Shell is trying to hold him on the line. Does a little work of his own. Shell saying, don't you do that to me. A very physical player himself is show. Third and seven is the crowd chance defense. Wow. Pastorini calls for time. Well, a very tough thing to do. Amazing to me because you don't want to give up those first downs. You're behind or timeouts. You might need them later on. It stops the clock with 2.20 left. And this reminder, 
that a week from today, next Sunday, we have a triple header in sports, as you can see. Our college basketball coverage continues. Got a dandy for you. Purdue, ranked eighth, takes on Syracuse, ninth ranked of the country. We'll be joining Al and Billy for that one in West Lafayette, Indiana. That'll be followed by a different kind of basketball. Meadowlark, Lemon, the Bucketeers. You know the fun that Lemon brings to the game. And Wilt Chamberlain, also in action. And then our golf season begins on NBC, and always one of the best. Sunshine out there in Palm Desert, California. The Bob Hope Desert Classic. The final round, 4.30 Eastern time. That's all on NBC next weekend. Talking to the Houston players yesterday and today before the game, Dick, one of the things that they were very quick to, to want to talk about was the fact that they did not want a repeat of last year's blowout in this AFC championship game. And they said, we've grown a lot in this year. They fought hard. They've worked hard to get back here. They had to come the hard way again as a wild card. And today, even though they have not played as consistently as the as the Pittsburgh Steelers, they have come up with the big plays. They've come up with the interceptions. They've come up with the turnovers. If they can get this one into the end zone for seven points, they've got a tight ball game. Third down, seven at the 20. Lauren Taves, 51 in as an extra linebacker. He's good on pass coverage. Only Carpenter behind Passerini. Blitz. Coleman, he makes the catch. First and goal at the seven-yard line as Ronnie Coleman went over the top of Lauren Taves. And how did Passerini ever unload that one? He was hit just as he tried to lob that High rainbow to Coleman. The Pittsburgh Steelers have gone to the blitz to control Pastorini. They couldn't get the get the rusher and the pressure on him with the regular plays, but Coleman, as he did last week, an incredible catch, and as he did earlier in the game. Watch Jack Lambert here. They're blitzing almost everyone. Lambert trying to come in to shield Pastorini. Pastorini did not know that that ball had been caught until he got up off the ground. Ooh, look at that. Dirt Winston unloading on Pastorini. With a minute and a half remaining in the third quarter, the Oilers six yards away from a tie. It is Renfro, touchdown, or is it? Out of play. A late call, the official did not make any signal, and now apparently has said no touchdown. He did not single. I don't think he could see the play. He looked down the end zone line to ask a call from the other official. He did not get a call. The officials are meeting now. They're trying to get the players out so they can talk about it. They may have to get a decision from Jim Tunney. Well, we're going to see it on the replay, and we'll be able to decide whether or not Renfro got his feet down in time. It was a tough call, and this might be a spot where an instant replay would be important. Let's see if the feet come down. Now he's got the ball. He does really get inside. It is there's a touchdown. No question about it. It was not called one, but there's no doubt that was a Houston touchdown. Well, they haven't made a final decision in the end zone. They're still down there talking about it. Now there's no question about this. He's got control. He has both feet down clearly in the end zone. It is a touchdown. Of course, the officials do not have the luxury that we enjoy of seeing that instant replay. The man on the spot didn't see it, so he couldn't call it. And now the Oilers are denied a touchdown. Oh, my. Bum could just eat that cowboy hat. Mike Renfro makes a fine catch of a well-thrown ball by Pastorini, gets both feet down, but no touchdown is the call. Sometimes the camera angles can be deceiving. Let's look from another angle and watch again. The feet, one, two, clearly down. There's not much question on, there is no question on that one. It's a touchdown. But the score remains 17 to 10 Pittsburgh. It's second and goal at the six yard line. And the Oilers overcome the bad call. Tim Wilson. five-yard line, and there he is, Jack Lambert, making the tackle, hustling from behind. Now, let's go back and look at what may be the most critical play of this game, a touchdown which is taken away from Dan Pastorini and Mike Renfro because the official was shielded by number 29, Ron Johnson. I can see why he couldn't see it, but the other official has to be in position to make the call. There's another official on the back line of the end zone under the uprights, then he should have made the call because he was not screened. No one called it, so the Oilers did not get a touchdown. Now it's third and goal at 
the five-yard line. Carpenter. And with a little help, the Pittsburgh Steelers have forced the Oilers into a field goal try. So instead of seven that they earned, now the Oilers must have to try for three. Now there's home field advantage, and then there's home field advantage. The error is human. Dan Pastorini trying to get it in. Throws short to Carpenter, who played so well. But right there, number 47, Mel Blunt, and he, the sure positive tackling of these Pittsburgh Steelers makes it virtually impossible to get into that end zone when they get a hold of you. And the Oilers get another bad break. They're now going to go from the good end of the field as the third quarter ends. Now they must try the field goal from the icy, uh, less sure footing of the end zone to our right. Timeout, end of the third quarter, 17 to 10, Pittsburgh. Bum Phillips. Dan Pastorini on the sidelines, and now they'll become spectators as Tony Frisch, out of the hold of Gifford Nielsen, will try to make three out of what should be already six or seven. It is a 23-yard attempt to open the fourth quarter. And it is good. Oh, that was so critical for the Oilers. If they had missed that, Merlin, in light of their bad luck, it would have been tough for them emotionally to recover. Now let's go back to what may, may be a play that we talk about for years to come, a touchdown that was ruled no touchdown. As a former player, what are your feelings? Well, Dick, I hate to see the big plays in a game, maybe the biggest play in this game, not made by the players on the field, but made by the officials. And I do sympathize with their situation. I sympathize with the fact that they are human. But this is a touchdown, and Houston, frankly, was cheated out of their six points or possible seven points and a tie in this game. A perfectly thrown pass, a beautiful execution of getting the feet down inside the end zone. But again, the official shielded. A second official who is in position to make the call apparently was not looking. The result, a four-point turnaround. And now, instead of being tied with a chance to try and get the football and go into the lead, they're still uh, behind in this ballgame by four points. It's almost the way that Bum Phillips enjoys it, though. That's the kind of team he's <laughs> had all year. Yeah. Through all that adversity, they've cut through and, and gotten themselves this far. And they're only four behind the world champions. They've done it the hard way all year, haven't they? they maybe maybe have. that's the way they'd want it today. Don't forget Skag tonight. That'll be at 8 o'clock premiere here on NBC. Larry Anderson to the 10. He's out to the 23-yard line where Guido Merkin, Steve Baumgartner, and company make the tackle. So Terry Bradshaw and the Steelers leading by four. And you wonder how Chuck Noel will play it here. What his advice to Bradshaw has been? Do you keep an open game going, or as you get into this fourth quarter, are you very careful with that four-point lead? Well, sometimes a bad break like that, Dick, uh, will serve to inspire a team. I, I don't know whether they know yet that they had the touchdown and it was taken away from them. I don't know whether they've been told. First down from the Steeler 23. yard line a gain of 13 yards for Franco Harris that gives him a total of 61 for the day you're going to see some great holding by Webster number 52 on the center look at him drag number 78 curly cope right out of that hole and Franco Harris number 32 up for the big gain watch it again he gets on curly's outside an influence play now watch him grab him right here and pull him away from the hole and does not get caught Things are going Pittsburgh's way at this juncture. A first down at the 36. Wire. No gain at all. Curly Culp perhaps angered by that last play. Elvin Bethay. No, it was Bethay who shot in from his defensive right end position. Well, I, I talked to Mike Webster. He said, after Culp has a bad play, he's going to come back and knock my head off. Especially so when you hang on to it. Down. There's what happens when you hold Curly Culp. Curly gets mad. Well, he didn't give him the blow. I thought he might on that particular play, but he did help to make the tackle. He did control his area, that's for certain. Second, and call it 11. Blyer, flag down, and Blyer goes down at 
the 45-yard line, but we have a penalty flag back at the 37-yard line. Jim Tunney's crew is going to be written about tomorrow, so let's, it's not a fair way to introduce them, but you're going to be hearing the names tomorrow. Tunney is the referee, Pat Hart of the umpire. Tony Viteri is the headlinesman. Jack Johnson is the line judge. The men involved in the possible call of the touchdown, no touchdown, were Stan Jabby, the back judge, Don Orr, the side judge, and Bill O'Brien, the field judge, who were the deep men. Number 89, 10 yards, still second down. Holding penalty against number 89, Benny Cunningham, on that last play. Well, the one thing I would say, again, I. I don't want to be the one to defend the officials, except that how can you make a call you can't see? And uh, it's it's a tough thing they have to do. And again, it's a shame that it happens on a play that is potentially the most important in the game. Second down and 20. Bradshaw changing his play. Good protection. as he was covering Lynn Swan. Swan didn't like the fact that Perry was resting on his ankle and kicked his way free. Perry had his eyes looking for his second interception. Perry would have loved to grab that one and get another turnover on Terry Bradshaw. For some reason, Greg Stemmerich is out of the out of the lineup. Hart, Hartwig is in, but watch Perry right there. He's just waiting in his position and just hanging on down there. I think he read that pattern coming out. Swan drug his foot a little bit there. Perry reacted to that. And a lot of emotion between these two teams. Third down, a long 20 for Pittsburgh at its 25. <laughs> 13 minutes left in the game. Bradshaw, a lot of time. And there he is at the 46 yard line, Lynn Swan. And I believe he has the first down. Oh, what an athlete. Houston Oilers trying to get the pressure on Bradshaw with a three-man rush. And on a slick feel like this, you cannot do it. You just can't do it. And Bradshaw will find the man who's singled up or the man who breaks from that double coverage. In this case, number 88, Lynn Swan. Big, big first down. Looked like maybe they were going to get him, force him to punt, have a chance to get down and get a touchdown or some points on the board. But Swan and Stallworth, or Swan and, and Bradshaw in this case, erase that opportunity. They're going to see if they can control the drive now. And in contrast to Pastorini, you saw Bradshaw with all that time to throw. Harris to the 49-yard line, a gain of about four. It'll be second and six on the clock. Ticks away, 12.25 left. Final quarter here at Three River Stadium, Pittsburgh, and Harris gets up slowly. Harris, such a brilliant playoff player. Back, as we told you earlier, has outrushed all other runners in 12 of the 15 playoff games in which he has appeared. And has rushed for over 1,400 yards in playoff action, a record. Second and six. Incomplete. Benny Cunningham, the intended receiver, covered by Stemrick and Perry. Vernon Perry. All CFL when he played at Montreal. First year in Houston. And a man who has introduced himself to the football public in a rather dramatic way these last two weeks. Bradshaw now looking at a third down and a short seven. Let's see if Houston comes with a blitz to try and get some pressure on him. They haven't been able to do it with a three-man rush. this time it's Harris and he has the first down I believe they spot it at the 44 yard line and that looks good enough for the first down one of the things that Pittsburgh Steelers do Bradshaw calls his own plays he's not afraid to pass on a first down and he's not afraid to run on a passing down he gives it to his trusted Franco Harris, and Harris must have measured that with his calipers. Dove for the first down. They're going to measure it, see if he got it. First down. For the 
Steelers leading 17 to 13 have another four downs and that says it all Franco. The other thing that's happening now Dick the Steelers are not only controlling the football as they have time of possession through the day they're also controlling the clock and every tick cost Houston another opportunity to try and get back ahead in this ball game. And even if they don't score, they're also buying real estate and forcing Houston deep into its own end. Bradshaw again well protected. It's good to Stallworth and the other half of that brilliant outside pass receiving team has a catch and a first down at the 30. Robert Brazil blitzing from the right side and number 77 Corson made a beautiful pickup right there. You see it at the top of your picture to give Bradshaw time to throw. And again, if he has time, he has such great receivers to work with. It's tough to shut him off. Seems that he has two or three seconds more than Pastor Rini. He has time to look for that second and third man. First down at the 29. 10 47 left in the game. Pittsburgh leads by four. Trap play. And he's down to the 22 yard line. A gain of seven more. A very impressive drive by the world champion Steelers. Down in the pits. It's another trap play. Corson coming across from his guard position to trap. They're getting good blocks in, blocks in there from Webster. And of course, Rocky Blair. What a trusted workhorse he's been. Having a big day today. What's up, Chris? <laughs> Swan is slotted left, and Cunningham splits Still right the tight end. Right now. Hello, Franco. <laughs> out of bounds at the 22. That'll be no gain. It'll be third and three. Art Stringer, well, that's true to his name. He strung out the play from his middle back position, and J.C. Wilson from the left corner to make the tackle. I think Bradshaw has been at his best today on these third downs. He's picked up almost 80% of his first down conversions on the day. That's really an incredible day. And of course, the Oilers are not a slouchy defense either. They come right at you. 9.59 left. Third and three. Pittsburgh at the Oiler 22. The boom. Defense jarred it free from Franco Harris as he timed his tackle perfectly. Interesting decision here. Got to believe that maybe Chuck Knoll, well, I thought for a minute he might go for it there, but he sent his field goal team onto the field. Swan looks to be wide open down in the corner. You can see the disappointment on his face, but that pass might have been caught were it not for the great hit put on the receiver by Greg Bingham. It is a 39 yard attempt by Barr. He missed earlier from 40 yards. Colquitt, who throws the ball very well, by the way, for a punter, is the holder. And Barr connects. And the Pittsburgh lead is back up to seven. Timeout, nine minutes, 50 seconds left. Steelers 20, Oilers 13. This is Don Olmeyer, Muffy Olmeyer, the lady with a hat, Pat Rooney. Watching intently, we're down to the 9.50 mark, fourth quarter, and Pittsburgh leads again by seven. And how very big that play in the end zone has turned out to be. Of course, now the Oilers need seven points to get them back into a tie in the possible overtime in this ball game. Here's Barr's kick as he skips it down and over the shoulder of Ellender. Ellender's trouble. And he's able to bat it out of bounds for the second time at the 12-yard line. And a flag goes down. Now Richard Ellender flying despite an injured hip. And not as mobile as he would normally be. And now a flag goes down apparently. A, well, at first it looked as if uh, Jim Tunney was saying against the Oilers, but he was just motioning come back this way. Well, it's possible that they might be calling him for batting the football, but... They're having a discussion on the sideline. El Ellender obviously wanting to knock that football out of bounds. Didn't want to have it recovered by the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
He had done it once earlier in the game in a situation with a punt down on the sideline. He did it there with a the kick. And of course, the sad thing is, no matter what happens here, it's very poor field position for the Houston Oilers. Illegally batting the ball by the receiving team during the loose ball. Penalty will be assessed on the kickoff. 15 yards and re-kick. So a 15-yard penalty against Ellender and the Houston Oilers. Although, in that regard, Houston can't come out much worse than having the ball down at about their 11-yard line, even though Pittsburgh now, unless they decline the penalty, or they don't have a choice, apparently, of declining the penalty. Well, it would almost seem that uh, the Steelers are being penalized for an Oiler penalty here. They would obviously like to see the football in the possession of the Houston Oilers right at that spot. You can see him batting the ball. He's not allowed to do that. Obviously, the Steelers wondering why, too. They, they have, have declined the penalty, and it will be first down Houston at the 11-yard line. Out of bounds. Out of bounds at the 11-yard line. So that's where the play will be initiated. So with nine minutes and 42 seconds remaining in the game, that problem has been clarified. Pittsburgh wisely declines the penalty. Houston has it at the 11-yard line. Dan Pastorini, during this delay, stayed on the sidelines with his heavy parka to stay warm. He comes onto the field with his team down by seven. I think the ruling there, if the man is trying to pick up the ball, he's trying to pick it up, and he bats it accidentally, they wouldn't enforce it. But if it looks like an intentional batting of the ball, then it is a penalty against the offensive team, and that's the case here. It was obvious that he was indeed trying to get the ball, swipe it out of bounds to protect. A first down for Pastorini in terrible field position at his own 11-yard line. But plenty of time, 9.42 left. In the last possession, Pastorini led his team the full distance of the field to an apparent touchdown. When the call was not made by the official, the Oilers settled for three. The Oilers really have had two drives during the day, but again, have had to rely on the big play. They need Pastorini, they need his throwing arm, and they need a big play right here to get him going. Campbell and Wilson with him in the backfield. Pastor on the wing right. Reverse to Caster. Gets nowhere. In fact, Caster almost fumbled the handoff. Robin Cole, 56, and Jack Lambert, 58, made the tackle. One of the things you're not going to do very often is fool this Pittsburgh Steeler defense. They're a veteran defensive team. They have excellent speed. Watch right here, Dick. Here's what you talked about. Caster almost lost it right there, but that's Robin Cole, 56, and Jack Lambert, the two fine linebackers teaming up. He had no chance. They do tackle you well. A long way home for Houston. Second and ten. Screen to Wilson. And what a play out at the 16-yard line by Cole again. There were two blockers on him. He was able to fight his way through and make the tackle of Wilson after a short gain when it appeared Wilson had big yardage ahead. That's the kind of play we saw earlier for big yardage and near the same part of the field. Again, a little bit of play acting. Get everybody inside. Dump it off to the running back. Watch it right there. Cole just gets enough of the leg to take him down. Third and about four and a half yards to go. And this is a very desperate situation. It's not over yet, but if they don't get a chance here, it might be. On the 17-yard line, to the 31 Lauren Tate showing you why they like him on pass defense in Pittsburgh he ran right with Carpenter chased him down from behind but not until number 26 Carpenter has a first down at the 31 Pittsburgh Steelers in sent in certain Taves on passing situations because of his coverage ability but Rob Carpenter comes up with one of the big plays that have been so familiar for him in the last three weeks and as we said that's not quite a do-or-die situation, but almost. We're at the midpoint of this fourth quarter. Seven and a half minutes remain in the game. Pittsburgh 20, Houston 13 the score. Screen to Wilson. 
two Steelers there. Dennis Whiston, 53, made the first contact with Donnie Shell, 31, securing the tackle. One of the things that a quarterback has to do, and this is a play ago, has to look over that rush. You see all of the arms and all of those big bodies. That's especially difficult against the four-man rush. Not so tough against the three-man rush. Of course, Pittsburgh employing four big linemen. Get those arms up in front of Pastorini. I think he's done a heck of a job today getting the ball on target as often as he's put it there. Harry Bradshaw. His team is in front by seven. Second down and eight at the 33 for the Oilers. the play down and only Wilson's desire to gain yardage gets him out of a hole and he picks up two to make a third down and five. Robin Cole makes still another tackle along with 67 Gary Dunn. When the running game is not going the play action passing is not a very effective and that Pastorini is continually faking the run. I don't think the Pittsburgh Steelers are even worried about that. They're going right after him. They spotted at the 35, so make it third and six for Houston. Double wing formation. Coleman in the left wing. They like to go to him. Instead, it's Guido Merkins who fumbles, and the Steelers have it. Merkins had the catch. Is the ball dead? The ball may have been blown dead. No. Donnie Shell came up with it. Still no official signal that the Steelers have the ball. Perkins, the third string quarterback, emergency wide receiver, caught it, hit hard, fumbles. We have a timeout, 5.46 remaining. Pittsburgh with the ball and the lead, 20 to 13. For the second time today, the Steelers on a Houston completion have forced a fumble and have it now at the Houston 45 yard line. We talked about how slippery that ball is on a day like today, and we have seen it bouncing around a great deal. It ended up in the hands of the Pittsburgh Steelers on what appeared to be a very big first down catch for the Houston Oilers. We'll see that play again right after this first down effort by Bradshaw. He needs only a field goal to all but put it away. 546 remaining. Franco a couple of yards to the 43. Let's go back. Pastorini to Guido Merkins. Now some of you may have wondered whether or not Merkins was down when he fumbled. Here's the answer. It's another great throw by Pastorini. Look at off balance. He throws flat footed, drills it right to Merkins. And it's just a matter of blunt stripping the ball away. Renfro almost got it, but Donnie Shell 31 recovered for Pittsburgh. And it's another example of the very physical tackling and the very physical defensive football that these Pittsburgh Steelers play. Second down and eight. Quick toss to Harris. Harris down to the 37. It'll be third and two. Jack Lambert's defensive unit has played with its typical toughness and they forced some turnovers when they didn't appear to really be there. I have to say though if I were picking my player of the game right now it would be Pastorini. I think he's been the most impressive player on the field. Under tremendous pressure Pastorini may have never thrown the ball any better. Cold 26 degrees he's hit his targets. He has been the offense. They've had no running game. Third and about two and a half Big play for Houston, trying to stop the Steelers. Bradshaw going deep. Flyer. 17-yard line. Mike Reinfeld on the coverage. That's just a matter of Blyer so wide open. It was an easy completion. And the pass. A finesse pass had to be lofted over the head of the defenders. Bradshaw again has tremendous time, but look how he hangs the ball over the top, lets it drop right into the hands. That's a fine catch by Rocky, too. He does his job as well as anybody around. Reaches low for that one, scoops it in, protects it. Oh, with three and a half minutes left, Bradshaw has the Steelers deep in Houston territory, leading 20 to 13.
thousand plus seats at Three Rivers. Most of them have not been used today. Half this crowd has been on its feet since the opening kickoff. Now Rocky Blyer taking advantage of the fact that this Houston defense trying to make the big play right now. So pepped up that they're almost over pursuing. Stringer running out beyond the play. Blyer cuts in underneath it. All of Franco Harris. Down to two minutes and 50 seconds as Bradshaw now has it second down and call it two and a half. Blyer to the nine yard line. Appears he's short of the first down by a yard. Art Springer made the tackle, but all the time the clock is running. 2:28. The Steelers, unless Houston calls time, do not have to run a play to the two-minute warning. Let's see if Houston stops the clock. I didn't know that Rocky Blair was this fast. He seems to getting to be getting faster rather than slower. Comes to the outside, gets around a block by Franco right there, and it's a great pursuit from the inside by Art Springer that stops him. It's a very short third down situation. There comes Bradshaw to the sideline to talk it over with Chuck Noll. So the Oilers let 30 seconds run off the clock after that play. They did not use one of the timeouts. We'll see how critical that is. Two minutes remaining in the game. Timeout, 20 to 13, Pittsburgh. And that Super Bowl victory is worth $32,000 per man, and the Steelers can taste it and they know how well it's digested as they are now at the nine yard line of the Houston Oilers third and one one of the reasons Houston didn't call time there remember Pastorini had to call time earlier in this half so they have only two remaining third and one the Oilers have to gamble defensively and stop Bradshaw Harris running 148 147 Franco Harris gets three yards plus in a first down and again watch the cut back by Harris the pursuit out in front of him Harris just merely times his cut lays in under the pursuit dives for the first down very very big play they're eating the clock up 128 left to go 84 yards now for Franco Harris as he's been the top runner in the game but that comes as no surprise down to 119 left. Harris again, no game. Curly Culp finished off the tackle, but the man down low is Andy Doris, 69. Time, Houston, stops the clock, 107 left. Well, is there any hope for the orders? We'll get Merlin Olson's answer to that when we return right now with a break in the action here at Three River Stadium. The Steelers lead by seven, 67 seconds left. Pittsburgh Steelers who beat the Dallas Cowboys Super Bowl at Miami last January Chuck Knoll has them just 67 seconds away from a trip to Pasadena Earl Campbell all but shut out by the Pittsburgh defense today the Steelers are down at the six yard line second and goal and the Oilers have only one timeout left 20 to 13 Pittsburgh Harris to the four yard line and time called by Houston with one minute exactly a minute left and you obviously try and strip the ball away in a situation like this you ask about a chance they do have a chance but they've got to get a miracle right here and I don't know maybe Bum has run out of miracles in this season he certainly has gone to that magic lantern many a time and rubbed it just the right way one minute to go timeout it's third and goal Pittsburgh the Steelers in front Pittsburgh, the city of champions, where the baseball Pirates and the football Steelers. And they have a third and goal outside the Houston four yard line with exactly a minute left, and the Oilers cannot stop the clock. Flyer! Touchdown! And the Steelers are on.
thing that Rocky Blyer carry that touchdown into the end zone to put the six on the board. They'll go for the seventh, but everything is behind them now. They've got this game in their back pocket. Barr kicks it through. Teddy Nathanson, our director. George Finkel, our producer. That series of pictures really told the whole story. The joy of Pittsburgh and the disappointment of Houston. A quick shot again. Some fine blocking in there. Number 63, Tom Dornbrook over there to make a beautiful trap block. And again, this Pittsburgh team will trap you every way but loose. They trapped that one right into the end zone. Terry Bradshaw, a very happy young man. He has had an outstanding day today. Merlinus, we have a moment here. I want to thank and congratulate Commissioner Pete Rosell of the National Football League and his capable staff for all of their support during the course of the year and to all of the teams and front offices that have made our job so pleasant our sincerest thanks it's been a marvelous year and one that we've enjoyed thoroughly we may also have given Commissioner Roselle something to think about with that end zone replay and I know how difficult that particular pill is to swallow they do not want to take the responsibility off the field I can understand that but it's tough again when the big play in the game is made by a touchdown in the corner. Although that last touchdown kind of makes it a little academic, doesn't it, Dick? 27 to 13. The kick comes down to Rob Carpenter, who runs it out of bounds at the 25 yard line. Of course, the clock stops as soon as the play is dead anyway, but Carpenter heads for the sidelines. And now it's a matter of just 49 seconds before these Steeler fans really celebrate. But wait till this year. Yep. Terry Bradshaw, the Steelers, Mike Adamley will be in their locker room, hear their comments in victory, and I'm sure one of them will be the great respect that they earned again after playing Houston. Talking about Houston, I think it's only appropriate to, to talk about the great season that they have had. Now you talk about fighting your way into these playoffs as a wild card two years in a row, and today giving the Steelers, who are the champions, everything they can handle. I'm really impressed. I think they're a great football team. Tim Wilson complete tackled immediately by Donnie Shell. And you know the Oilers win or lose are going to have a big party at the Astrodome. The fans down in Houston some 47,000 showed up last year after they lost here in Pittsburgh. And they're planning the same type of get together to say thank you to their team after today whether they won it or lost it. And it's to be commended those Houston fans are as vocal and as supportive as this Pittsburgh group. Complete to Barber. And with 14 seconds, 13, 12, 11, the Oilers with two great victories to get here. But again, the favored Pittsburgh Steelers have proven they are the class of the American Football Conference. The final score, the champion Pittsburgh Steelers 27, the Houston Oilers 13. To Barney McGinley, Tim Fogarty here in our NBC booth, Coach Sam Rotigliano, and our congratulations to the American Football Conference champions, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Thanks, Joe Costanza, his statistical work, Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw, that defense, uh, the steel curtain, other than the long interception touchdown by Vernon Perry, they technically kept the Oilers out of the end zone. And I think one thing you have to know about these Steelers. They've been working all year to get back into that championship game, that Super Bowl game. They really weren't even very loud and noisy in their locker room that